cleared land, and we're doing my tribe today. I'm very happy. Yes, we get to see what the, uh, what the electric eye has to say about everything. Yeah, even though the Red Talons are my favorite tribe, this is the tribe that I identify the most with. That's probably a bad thing, considering what we're going to say this episode. Oh yeah, we're gonna spend the whole episode talking shit about whoever wrote this document that we're- that we're going uh, with. That being the tribe book. Oh no. Oh no, oh no, the Glassworker but um... The narrator is a lying sack of shit, but the, the the writers themselves did a fantastic job with this one. Yes, I, I agree that way. It's like the, the unreliable narrator theme continues throughout the, the Glasswalker tribe book. And something I noticed with this tribe book in particular, it is hyperlinked to books that aren't even written yet. I uh, It is... To get the full story of this, I have had to go to all the other spots. I have had to go to Kith Book Knockers. I've had to go to Tradition Book Virtual Adepts and Sons of Ether. I've had to go to Clan Book Giovanni in Malkavian. I've had to go to Kindred of the East and every other tribe book in Werewolf to get the full story of this tribe. Because the Glasswalkers refuse to give you the straight answer. This entire tribe book is nothing but pro-Glasswalker propaganda. These guys are lying to you beginning to end. And it's funny because the first edition book tells you the truth straight up. So I've had to compare those two. And yeah, the time passes between editions. First edition was written in the 90s and second edition is written uh, post Y2K. So it's treated as a passage of time because the Giovanni are in a very, very different mood between first and second edition. But even so, the stuff you did in first edition, that carries over to second edition, and you sweep all of that under the rug. So we're going to air out some Glassworker dirty laundry this episode. Oh yeah, and it's going to smell yeah. like a melting GPU. And I hope that you don't hear my microphone giving feedback in the background. I am sitting up straight this time. Because I was listening to the playback of our Silent Striders episode, and it's a ASMR video because I keep hearing static coming in through my microphone. I was still as a statue that entire time, but just this microphone touching my shirt creates a feedback loop. Yeah, I'm and good. If, if if I still hear it this time, then there's something wrong with my microphone, and then I'm gonna have to get an entirely new set. Yeah, I'm I'm usually up at my desk. So like my dad, you, my dad tried to record music a little while ago, and then just kind of didn't. So I basically mm -hmm. stole his like audio setup, and I have it in my room. Like, <laughs> I sent my I sent John a picture a little while ago um, of what my microphone looked at, because like the thing that held the microphone to the stand, the bolt stripped on it. So I literally went to Home Depot, got a bolt and a nut. And I literally took the, the wrench out of my toolbox and I just like cranked it on there. I rednecked up my mic stand. <laughs> it's great. I love this damn thing. I, I am Johnny. I'm the guy who runs the show. That's Kyle. He's the guy who does all the post production stuff. I stuff I'm too dense and impatient to do. Yes. Uh, let's that that cut that A plus is, is paying for itself. And Ryan is back. He's muted right now, but yeah, Ryan yeah, is back. Ryan. Yes, yeah, yes, I am back. I, yeah. I'm trying to be quiet. Uh, I've got people coming downstairs and talking to me, so. Uh, okay. Uh, we have I am Ryan here, though. for this episode. Yes, he is. Right, Master Ryan. Yes. Okay, so. And we begin. Something I would like to point out as we start. This book has what, five different narrators going through the whole book. And it's a little messy to read at times, but that's the point, because we'll we'll go into it later. No two sound no sound writers. Glasswalkers think the same. We begin our history. Yes. Do we want to start in the Middle East or China? Uh start in the Middle East. China's a different animal from what I've read. Uh, the Middle East, where three different tribes started. Of course, we have the Children of Gaia, who started around the area of Sy uh, Syria, 
Lebanon, Georgia, Azerbaijan. The silent shredders who started in the thick of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Oman, the glass workers started in Persia. On the Iranian werewolf, these guys got their start by being a couple of guys who were just alone on a Friday night when the Silver Fangs came up to them and said, the Babylonians are doing some pretty cool stuff with their civilization. We want you to spy on them. They went over to Babylon, take a look at the hanging gardens and the birth of civilization in the, in the West, and they called over some other wolves and said, hey, you gotta check this out. This is pretty cool. And so you have all these wolves looking at Babylon, and they say, this looks incredible. We gotta get a piece of this. So these guys all infiltrate Babylon, ancient Babylon, and they call themselves the Warders of Apes. They didn't think very highly of humans back then, but they were very quick to change that name. The first name, this, well, technically not the first, the first name we will know this tribe as are the Warders of Men. Uh, to make it short and sweet, we'll call them the Warders for this portion of the story. Yep. And Purge him. Yes. So Kyle, so Kyle. Yep. I, I as a Silver Fang, come into your house and say, if you want to continue to work for us, you've got to kill your pet. Will you, do you do it? Oh, absolutely not. No. Uh, that's exactly what the Warders of Men thought. The glass workers gave the order to kill all humans, and the warders refused to do it. I mean, granted, if there was a silver fang looming right over their shoulder, they had no choice. But they tried their best to kill as few humans as possible. They didn't lobby like the Children of Gaia, Fianna, Silent Striders did. They just kept to themselves because we got some observing to do. We can't pry our eyes away from the humans. If we blink, they'll do a trick and we'll miss it. And of course, the Imperium ends. Good for them. They get to continue observing. Oh, what happens after this? Uh, the War of Rage. A War of Rage. And this they have no problem with. Uh, there goes Jackie Music, in case you heard anything. Uh, no, I didn't hear uh, anything. Yeah, they love the humans, not so much the other Pharaoh. When it came to this, they just said, all right, whatever. Uh, all you Gural and all you Macaulay clear out, and they just pushed them out of Persia. When the Macaulay and Gural started retaliating, they pushed back even harder. From their perspective, all Gural died during that fight, and then the Macaulay just went away. They didn't follow up on the Macaulay, but to their knowledge, at the time, all the werebears were dead. And something funny happens. We haven't talked that much about Mage on this channel yet, but around this time, Atlantis was happening. Miles Atlantis, Edge. the... Oh, yes. Uh, you, you've seen the Spongebob episode, Atlantis Scrapantis, right? No, I saw the Disney movie Atlantis, which is my favorite Disney movie. Uh, well, you're thinking of... Fantastic movie. You, you, it is. You're, you're both thinking Disney, I'm, I'm thinking Spongebob, but... <laughs> <laughs> It, it pretty much was what you think it was in both of those shows, where Atlantis was this incredibly advanced civilization that may or may not have had some demonic involvement. We're not here to speculate on Demon the Fallen today. And they built the first machine with working complex parts, and it creates the machine Messiah. Um, as Colt and me like to call it, the Antichrist. Yes, we hate the Antichrist. <laughs> This incredibly advanced machine appears in front of the glass walkers, uh, no, not glass, walkers of men, and it says to them, I will give you technology beyond your wildest belief if you choose to follow me. I will give it to you slowly to make sure that nobody tries to raid you and steal that technology away from you. Follow me, follow my will, and I will give you power beyond your belief. And the warders say, that sounds great, but we already have a guy. And they point behind them and point at Cockroach. How do we feel about cockroaches? Uh, pretty slimy, not gonna lie. Ryan, what about you? Uh, I'm not huge bugs in general. 
the fact that cockroaches can fly is terrifying. Yeah, true, but they Cockroach are not immune a... to a redneck with a blowtorch, as it turns out. It's true. Yep. We got good old Bonars, the ultimate deterrent against cockroach. We had to talk about the hill people when we talk about the Bonars, but that's an episode another day. Cockroach is the ultimate survival list. You may say that about rat. Uh, rat is more of a warrior. Cockroach, you just can't kill cockroach until, um, you know, 2020 comes around, but we'll talk about 5e in a minute. Cockroach is a genius, an evil genius. He is sleazy, he is disgusting, he has an answer for everything, and he's right about most things. Morally, he's terrible, but in terms of logic, this guy's a genius. He had taken over the Warders of Men as their totem and decided that I will be the one to lead them to greatness because I know everything. I am Cockroach. And there was a possible totem that they could have had called Rock, um, who is exactly what he sounds like, but... Rock just disappears from the story. I don't know what happens to him, but you now they could have had Rock, but instead it picked up Bug. So, you know, you lose that Rock Paper Scissors game. And uh, Colt, you're uh, Kyle, you're Jewish. Uh, what happens? Um, uh, sorry, go back, go back real quick. Well, I, lost, <laughs> I lost focus. Uh, the Old Testament happens. Yes. Okay. There we go. And the glass walkers are there when Abraham builds the cities, when the 12 tribes of Israel form, when Joseph becomes a vizier of Egypt, during everything involving the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, they are there during the formation of Hebrew society. And uh-oh, uh-oh, Cal, is that some anti-Semitism I see? Ever so slightly. <laughs> These are the wolves that are very good with money, and they grew up in Israel. Oh no! Don't don't worry. They didn't take uh, Judaism as a religion. No. They okay, didn't. we're safe. They they had the cockroach, oh. and that was it. Okay, good, good. They stayed pagan. All right, good. Yes, they did. Dodged the anti-Semitic bullet. <laughs> <laughs> I qualify this as a Jewish American citizen. This episode cannot be called anti-Semitic. Yeah. <laughs> While biblical times are going on, it's around, I think the year they give is around 2000 BC. And while the glass walkers are roaming around, they find a land called China. And they head on over. They heard a guy called Salat had been here. Uh, he came back with a third eye. Maybe they can get a third eye. They head over and they meet a bunch of werewolves who also follow Cockroach that they have never heard of. These guys introduce themselves as the Boli Johije. We will call them the Boli for simplicity. Also, none of you are Chinese, so it's very hard to uh, pronounce Chinese. I, it's, it's, I struggled for a while. I thought it was Johije, but no, it's no. You're supposed to have spit out the Z's when you say it. Yeah, I'm, I I can't speak Chinese. Yeah. And these guys are saying, "Hmm, China's pretty cool. What's been going on here?" And the Boli say, "Oh, you know, we've you know looked around." We've helped build a few palaces. We helped build a wall. Uh, we are really, really good at architecture. You want to see our designs? They say, yeah, shit, yeah. And so they start comparing, and some warders are so blown away by the Bali that decide, yo, fuck the land of milk and honey. I'm staying in China. And the two of them have a great time, but the Bali are more interested in building stuff. The warders are more interested in observing so they say goodbye to the Boli, and we put a pin in the Boli for now, we'll come back to them later. And they head back on over to the land of milk and honey. And have a wonderful time. And in case you're asking about Set, they did not participate in any of that. No, they were hanging out in Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, you're going to find out that the Glasswalkers make for very fair weather friends. Yeah. Uh, we, talk we also talked about a little bit about, um, well, on this, uh, thinking about Judaism... It's funny that the Glasswalkers want to point out that they chose to be Buddhist. They had Boli in the early, early temples of Buddhism. 
and they started hanging around and started modifying Buddhism a little bit. They came up with, oh God, okay, I pull this up. Uh, I believe it's Mahayana Buddhism. Yeah, I think so. Where, yeah, the Mahayana have a matriarchal figure that they decided that they were going to sneak Gaia, Mother Gaia, into Buddhism. Uh, that's her that you're venerating, uh, not whoever it's supposed to be. The last workers don't care to tell you. And along with that, they started influencing a little bit. They take credit for the Trikaya, which are the, the three faces of Buddha. To explain what those are, that's the uh, pure being, the blissful being, and the tr transformative being. That they had be the um, wild weaver and worm, respectively. Kind of similar to how the uh, silent striders will use Ta, Jehuti, and Apep as the faces of the wild weaver and worm. And the, bo the bully, we can, we'll stick that pin back into them. And sure, a, the Christ comes around and a few class walkers decide to follow Christ. But they have a bigger fish to fry. The Holy Roman Empire. So a point that me and Kyle keep bringing up about why the Shadow Lords just suck as a tribe is because the Shadow Lords tried to infiltrate the church once, failed because of the little Sombra, and then just gave up. Yep. They said, oh, there's too many yeah, empires. Because, we can't do that. Yeah, because that's what you do as a Shadow Lord. You quit. You're just the biggest quitter. They really are. So the Glasswalkers say, oh, you tried infiltrating this, this empire? We can do that. So the glass workers sneak in, and because they have been observing humans for thousands of years, they flawlessly blend in with the Romans. And they decide, we want to get some friends in on the hustle. They look over at the children of Gaia and say, hey, you guys, uh, you want a piece of the action? And the children of Gaia said, hell yeah, let's do it. They look over at the Black Furies, and the Black Furies, of course, snarl at them until they're asked, hey, do you want to join in on the Roman infiltration mission? And the Black Furies are all for it. And so the three of them sneak in and do what no Shadow Lord was able to do, infiltrate the Roman Empire. And no, they didn't lead to the complete collapse of the Roman Empire. They had business to do. They weren't interested in destroying the Roman Empire like the Geta Fenris and the Shadow Lords were. They were inf interested in changing the empire from the inside out. They saw Ventru leadership, and the, gl the Glasswalkers will tell you that the Ventru are the closest to the worm out of all the vampires. I disagree with that point, because we made an entire episode about the true Wormish vampire. But, you know, they don't have that much experience with the Church of Set, so we'll say you're... it. it you, you can call the, the Ventru that, even though you're wrong. Just... Whatever floats your boat. The Venture can be pretty, pretty sleazy, pretty nasty guys. They're still not the Ministry. Oh, still not the Ministry. Uh, if if a Venture had the stones to do what the Ministry do... Then the world would already be over. Yeah, instead they'd just rather talk a big game with Dominate. Yeah, makes sense. So, when Rome eventually grows too big and collapses, the... Glasswalkers, all wars and men, all swap out their centurion masks with nun habits, and they infiltrate the church as it becomes the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, you want to know why the Virgin Mary is so um, venerated. fixated upon? Yeah, venerated in Catholicism. It's because of the combined effort of the Glasswalkers and Black Furies. You have them to thank for that. Very nice. And they, and they start changing the way Christianity is taught in the Roman Empire. By this time, hands have changed from the Ventru running the show to the La Sombra running the show. And the La Sombra want you to believe that God is this mad dictator holding you above a pit of fire, ready to drop you in the minute you commit, commit a sin. Uh, the Glassworkers weren't okay with that. They decided that we are going to start putting in uh, happy God propaganda. Uh, God loves you and Jesus loves you. Uh, it's like a good old episode of Veggie Tales, and they start getting a more merc merciful God. Um, I think you remember Jordan Pearson saying that there is a divide in the Old and New Testament where God in the Old Testament is ready to kill a drop of a hat, 
and then God in the New Testament is extremely forgiving, and so is Jesus. Yeah, what was that story? I think it was in the Old Testament in which uh, the devil tells God to test one of his followers by the killing his wife. Yeah, Job. His What's up? Yeah, it was the book of Job. The book of Job, that's it. Mm. And, you know, it's a pretty wasn't big just, a, juxtaposition. What? Wasn't there a story about uh, God telling someone that he needed to sacrifice his son on this high mountain? God telling yeah, Abraham, Abraham to kill Isaac. Yeah. And when he did, he's like, well, why the fuck you do that? Yeah. He said, don't kill your son. Kill this lamp instead. And then we can do the exchange. So they, in case you're wondering why there's such a juxtaposition, the World of Darkness explains it was the Glasswalkers who had something to do to do with that. So, um, thank you for making religion a little bit more approachable. Um, I feel better not fearing God. <laughs> I feel like most people would, in all honesty. Yeah. And what happens around this time? Uh, the Inquisition! I'm glad you brought that up, Kyle. The Inquisition happens. <laughs> I didn't think that was my job. So, so the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, and the Spanish do such a good job, they influence everyone else to do their own Inquisition. And then, of course, St. Leopold had to die a violent death and influence the Church of St. Leopold to form. And now vampires are being picked off in the church like flies. And the glass walkers start sweating bullets. They realize, oh shit, we're all about to die. We can't transform for a while. So they put their heads down. Yeah, there we go. You can blow that meme up in chat. <laughs> okay, hang on. It's in uh, history. Oh, where's... oh, it's in meme chat. Give me yeah. a second. Yeah, it's in meme chat. Yeah, so the Spanish Inquisition comes in. And no. the Spanish Inquisition in the World of Darkness, these guys are shooting the fire of Mount Sinai from their eyes and smoting a vampire in one hit. The glass workers know that they can't fight against that. I mean, sure, they have crazy cockroach powers, but that's not going to do anything against the entire Inquisition, against humans that just woke up and realized that they were being controlled. So the glass workers keep their heads down for years. It is very difficult to be a glass worker. And some, some of them just forget what they are as werewolves. Some of them become a little too human during this time. And... It's around this time that the glass workers are seen with a little bit of skepticism. The glass walkers are looked at by the Silver Fangs and the Shadow Lords and are saying, we're not sure if you're wolf enough to be part of the Guru Nation. You've, you were making progress, you were giving us some pretty valuable intel, but now you've stopped. Are you sure you want to be part of this nation? And of course, the Red Talons are looking at them. The Red Talons are getting their asses beat by the Inquisition. And I think it's pretty unfair that the glass workers aren't doing anything. The glass workers are trying. They're trying to play the misinformation game. But, dude, it's the Inquisition. The Camarilla and Sabat didn't have an answer for that. So, Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Not even the nope, glass and walkers. A sh and a shitload of vampires died. And the Convention of Thorns had to happen. And eventually, vampires just vanish for a few years, and the glass workers say, okay, um, job's done. We're going to wait uh, one or two more years, and then we can go back to being wolves. And right as they were beginning to get a little bit more wild again, um, philosophy happens. Kyle, have you read Hegel? Hegel? No, I have not. Have you read Immanuel Kant? I have not read a lot of... I have not read any philosophy. I'm behind on all my philosophy. Have you read Sir Thomas Aquinas, William of Ockham, Anselm of Canterbury, Dun Scotus, Peter Albillard, uh, got, um... What was I going to say? Uh, Dante Caligari, and all these other mid Middle Ages philosophers, because the glass workers did. Just anytime a book would land in their laps, they would pick it up and start reading... And, oh, it's Sean posted a meme. Gotta check that out later. Another, oh boy. Uh, don't put that one up yet. Oh. So, the glass workers start reading every book that lands in their lap. And, of course, Immanuel Kant was the master of stupid ideas before Karl Marx was born. So, they start thinking, uh, let's become um, philosopher wolves instead of Catholic wolves. 
And around this time, the Protestant Reformation happens. You can you can drop the Catholic Church game now. We don't have to focus on the church so much anymore. So they change their name and become the Tetrasomnians. And that is the lamest fucking name you could have come up with. Uh, I, I'm sure it's supposed to mean something to somebody that's read all keyword, all of the medieval uh, Enlightenment literature. They were supposed to be elementalists. They started looking at hermetic text too, and thought of the four elements when they were thinking of that name: air, wind, um, air, earth, water, and fire. So that's what inspired the name. And of course, they're saying, "Oh, we're we're definitely going to put some guy and propaganda in this one." But they get so distracted with the philosophy that they forget to put the propaganda in, and f which further increases the schism between the Tetrasomnians. And the Geru Nation as a whole. And now we don't know what to think of these guys. Granted, the Gloss Workers did infiltrate a lot of political bodies at the time. Uh, I'm trying to think of one here in particular. Uh, namely, namely Italy. That's, uh, you, you know, Milan, Napoli, all the different kingdoms of Italy. Uh, it's, it's kind of weird that Italy is such a weird, uh, such a young country, dude. I keep forgetting that country is only 200 years old. Yeah, because it was it was just like a, a loose confederacy of warring kingdoms for the longest time throughout the uh, throughout the Re Middle Ages and Renaissance period. Yeah. You're going to hear a beer crack open. All right. In proper uh, show, in never... proper Galliard fashion. Yep, I never film any one of these episodes without a beer. <laughs> I feel like that's an issue, but I'm not going to bring it up because I do the same thing. Except today, it's cooking. Yeah, no, it. It, it made it it lowers like like my strength like it lets me speak my mind. Makes sense. I'm not relying right? on it. It's, I'm I'm not relying on it. But I can't deny what it does. True. I'm sitting here with peanut butter and water. <laughs> yeah, the get a Fimrus here is holding uh, a healthy diet. Yes, got to got to keep fit in order to fight the worm wherever it dwells, wherever it breeds. The get a Fimrus will tell you that you gotta double up on the protein and cut back on the carbs. Of course. Shit, I should probably so, go get a beer to defy him. And once again, I'd like to point out that the Glasswalkers are doing what the Shadow Lords try and fail to do for years. I mean, the Shadow Lords, the way you're supposed to play them is that it's a werewolf that acts like a vampire. The Glasswalkers do that, and they don't try. They just act natural. So once again, I have to ask, why are the Shadow Lords a tribe again? <laughs> Oh, because their before father's now, so episode. Their great, 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 great grandfather was a prince's squire's sheep son's king of a third of a third earl. I don't fucking know. And they follow the they follow the super fascist as a totem. Then we have to obey the super fascist. We have to be these fruitcake nut job weirdos who want to control people all the time. Yeah, that's not gonna fucking Lovely. happen, Gara. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. I can hate that tribe. <laughs> <laughs> this whole podcast can be renamed to Fuck the Shadow Lords. Yeah, the Why, why the Shadow Lords Suck Part 5. Yep. yep. Uh, what happens next? Well, the Gloss Walkers get so wrapped up in... Well, Tetrasomnians get so wrapped up in pissing time away with philosophy that by the time the New World shows up, uh, eh, we'll do it. Um, a bunch of werewolves infiltrated the pilgrims as they were sailing over in the Mayflower. Uh, they didn't die. Um, all these other loser humans get to die of all these different sicknesses at sea, and then they get to starve to death. We get to survive, because we're smart, and we still have contact with some spirits. So they make it over to America, and yeah, they see the Wendigo, and they see the Croatan, and neither of them really know what to think of the Tetrasomnians, this is their first contact, besides the, um, besides the Gethafenris for the, for the Wendigo. Wendigo, yeah, the Wendigo leave it alone. They say, uh, it's probably just more Gethafenris by another name. Leave it alone, and the Croton, of course, have no idea what to think. They're trying to ask the Wendigo for advice. The Wendigo tell them to fuck off, and of course, the Gloss Walkers are so wrapped up in observation that they forget to do anything when it comes to the Revolutionary War. They just decide we're just going to let it happen. Uh, we're going to have spies on the American side and British side, and we're going to sell information to each other for fun. And, of course, we're going to eventually side with the Americans once we realize that the 
British are backed entirely by the technocracy. And by this time, we know what the technocracy are, and we really don't like them because they're doing the same thing we're doing, but they're crazy authoritarians. So, you know, yay America. 1776 happens. Hell yeah. yeah. America becomes independent, and the gloss workers become hyper fixated on America. They love America. They're seeing a new group form here. I would like to fix a mistake that we made in the Wendigo episode. I gave you the wrong name of the Sons of Ether at the time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The Sons of Ether, I've gone through several name changes, like the, um, like the Glasswalkers. So, while these guys were known as the uh, Tetrasomnians at the time, I believe these guys were called the... Oh, this name sucks. The Pupils of Par of Parmen Parmenides. Parmenides? You okay. can see why I just you, you can see why my brain just clicked to calling them the Sons of Ether. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's a terrible name. I mean they had a terrible Absolutely. name at the same time as the Glasswalkers at that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but the one extremely pretentious faction meets another extremely pretentious faction, and the Glasswalkers would love to deny this. But they were friends with the Sons of Ether at the time. And the Sons of Ether, in case you say I'm lying about this or I'm wrong, you read the tradition book of the Sons of Ether, they bring these guys up by name in this book, in the Sons of Ether book. These guys work together to this day. The Sons of Ether love inventing technology, and then they sell it over to the Glasswalkers and say, do whatever you want with this. You give us your corporate wolf money. We'll give you weapons beyond your wildest belief. That's why eventually I'm going to make a comparison between the Glasswalkers and the Tremere. Because when you have friends with mages, plural, you get to have some crazy abilities if you stack into resources as a Glasswalker. So, while these guys are having a great time with Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton, they are completely oblivious to all the mayhem going on behind them. They don't even know the Storm Eater is coming. They don't even know that the Eater of Souls is coming. So they just sit around and piss time away with the Founding Fathers while everyone else dies. Sounds like him. <laughs> great move. Great move. <laughs> GG. Good job, fellas. Yeah, good job. Uh, you know how to cast magic now at the expense of so many lives. Great. Yeah, they were having fun. And then, and time goes on. The American Civil War happens, and these guys think, well, great. Um, who do we side with? Do we side with the Confederacy, or do we side with the Unions? We don't know. Hmm. And they look between the two. And eventually they pick Union. But it's not because they believe in setting slaves free. Is because another totem appears around this time. This guy is unique to second edition. This guy was nowhere in first edition. So, Starbridge Lion appears. How much do you know about trains? Uh, I watched a lot of Thomas the Tank Engine when I was a kid. I right, just keep that in mind, Ryan. What do we know about trains? They go from point A to point B pretty fast. That. Uh, so I'm pulling up a picture of what Starbridge Lion looks like. Um, the actual train. I'm posting in history pages. All right. So that's what that train looks like. Very classic looking train. Yeah, blow that up on the page. That's up there. So <clears throat> this living train spirit approaches them and says, I have been born yesterday. And I have got all this knowledge inherently about railway systems and railroads are the future, guys. We gotta invest all into railroads. We gotta do that Ponzi scheme. We gotta do all that fraud involving building railroads. And the gloss workers say, yeah, that's an excellent idea. And then they do the Ponzi scheme. <laughs> We're great for them for like, you know, 100 years or so. Until they got caught. But... Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> so, so they fight for the Union. Um, yeah, something fun. These guys are war veterans, too. Um, it's around this time... Well, they, they had this as a totem for a while, but now it becomes relevant. Uh, the award winner for dumbest totem name, Clashing Boom Boom. Uh, formerly, known as, for, formerly known as Minerva. Uh, maybe you should go back to that name. Yeah, Minerva's <laughs> a much better name. 
this is a female spirit of war. Um, the uh, the exact origin of Clashing Boomum is, is kind of up in the air. Uh, Monkey King is explicitly listed to be human or monkey first. Clashing Boom Boom just kind of existed already and has seemingly always existed until Cockroach picked them up. And you bet that popular usage of Clashing Boom Boom came into play during the Civil War. I mean, granted, uh, she was active during the Revolution, but Civil War, oh yes, now we start seeing camps of Glosswalkers following Clashing Boom Booms. Uh, they're not known as the Tetrasomnians anymore. They changed their name, again, to the Iron Riders. Um, award for best werewolf name right there. Yeah, that, that, that was pretty sick when I read it. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like the Iron Warriors and Iron Hands of Warhammer 40k. And just putting the word iron in something makes yeah. it automatically cooler. <laughs> so, Very true. Just it's ask Iron time Maiden. That, yep. It's around this Iron, time that Iron Cockroach Maiden, says Iron, Man. Iron yeah. Maiden, Iron Man. Um, Iron Giant. Yes. Uh, while we make, let's make Iron Giant a totem for the Glasswalkers. That'd be kind of sick. Yes. <laughs> they probably I'm have them Superman. built already with the. They probably built them already with the, with with the Sons mages, of Ether. Yes. <laughs> yep. So, Cockroach puts on a Hawaiian shirt, puts his hat on, Picks up two briefcases and says, I'm going on vacation. Uh, Starbridge Lion is your totem while I'm on vacation. Uh, I'm still the boss, but I'm going to take some time off. I've been your totem for 10,000 years. I'm taking a vacation. So, Starbridge Lion takes over. And a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of Iron Riders take Starbridge Lion as a totem. But now we start having a schism. Granted... You already had one with the Tetrasomnians because none of the philosophers get along with each other. Ask Friedrich Nietzsche what he thought of other philosophers. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, have you ever read Beyond Good and Evil? I, I have not. The best part of that book is when Friedrich Nietzsche says, the only reason philosophers exist is because they're lonely weirdos who try to justify their own worldview and think publishing a book automatically makes them right. Given the fact that I was in a thr that I was in an antique shop the other day and saw a book that was unironically called the ham the, the 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 what was it the handbook of euthanasia? Yes, that's a, he's absolutely correct. <laughs> Fuck philosophers, they suck. I want to see if I can, did. You see, see a wheel that, that, uh, Hang on, the, the multicolored World Economic Forum wheel on it. No, no, it, it was an old book. I, I gotta find it, and I gotta pull it out. There's a bit of a deviation, but, like, I saw that, and I was like, I was really tempted. Yeah, the handbook on euthanasia. I'm gonna pull this up real quick. Uh, yeah, pull it up on the screen. Yeah. yeah. That, 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 this, yeah, this kind of Luciferian thought has existed for years. It it's is. It's not new. It was $6 <laughs> in an antique shop, and I was really tempted to I'm, buy it just for good songwriting. I, except my computer. I wouldn't even give it six school. cents. No, no, absolutely not. I'm going to put that in meme chat, or no, I'll put that in yeah. deranged chat for you guys to, to gawk yeah, at. Yeah, deranged, because that's where it belongs. Yes! The fact that it, <laughs> the fact that I saw that and that was a thing was harrowing enough. Anyway, back on back on track. Uh, yeah. All right, so, uh, no, on, on thought of that track, you know that it, the minute werewolves get into philosophy, with these guys being naturally angry, thanks to the auspices, you can get how you can understand just how vitriolic and vicious these guys got in philosophy debates. So the younger Tetrasomnians were already pretty sick of the older ones, given that their philosophies never aligned. That tension exploded with the Iron Riders. You have all these big fucking intellectuals that try to out intellectual all the other intellectuals, and you end up creating this tribe within a tribe within a tribe where all these other tribes are fighting each other and nobody is willing to compromise. And this is the big issue I have with anyone who... This is why I hated going to college so much, dude. Yeah. And just why I, why I can't talk to anyone who's college age. Because you end up in this big pseudo-intellectual war where nobody ever refuses to be wrong or show humility. That was that and... whole rant from Fritz the Cat, like when he was in the room and everybody was studying for finals. Just like, 
<laughs> he was like walking around talking about all these guys with their noses buried in all these books trying to be some big fucking intellectuals. Yeah, you got, you got all this like anthropology and sociology and shit that's in inspiring at the time until you realize that you're never going to use it in real life. <laughs> Basically, yes. And you and you want to cling on to it like it's gospel. And this is what starts tearing the Iron Riders apart. None of them like each other. See somebody? Yeah, there's the Frisky Cat bit. <laughs> yep, that's going yeah. up while we're so you, while we're talking about this. Yeah. So you have all these Iron Riders who are at each other's throats, and tensions are high within the within the Iron Riders. But thanks to the Ponzi scheme and thanks to infiltrating the Rockefellers and getting some of their money, uh, thank you for directly aiding Pentex. By the way, you ass hats. <laughs> the yeah. worm comes so, again. So. With worm money in their hands, they get incredibly rich. Um, think of Dutch Vanderlyn's gang from Red Dead Redemption 2. That is a perfect example of an Iron Rider tribe, and of an Iron Rider pack, and another perfect example of just how tense things were between the Iron Riders because nobody in that camp got along. Every day there would be a blow-up argument over something stupid, and that was life as an Iron Rider. It was miserable. And while Starbridge Lion do uh, his best, but it's not good, it's not good enough. Um, trains don't make for very good CEOs or very good leaders. And what happens after the boom of the railroads? Well, the 1920s happened, and now the rich become stupid rich. The glass workers have more money than they know what to do with. And you have all these Iron Riders that start forming companies that are still around to this day. And the longest surviving faction of Iron Riders ex comes into being around this time. The Wise Guys. So, I believe I posted in history pages. Uh, you, yes. see that, you see that picture with um, all the guys who have shining eyes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Blow that up. All right. <clears throat> Zoom in on the paragraph that is labeled Lupines. Yep. Uh, do you want me Glassworkers, to read that? This is you. In, uh, in a fur, you're going to read that. Yeah, like, Glassworkers, this is you. This is you. Like, Lupines. Le oh, oh, sorry, this is an Italian guy. All right. Lupines. This is clan book Giovanni. Leave the him the fuck alone unless you really know what you're doing. Italy and Sicily are crawling with dog boys, and they're a lot of the reason we don't have any more royal establishments. They hate us because we're full of worms or something, and we'll attack on sight. So don't ask for a quarter. One of the clans, the Glass Walkers, is an exception to the rule, and we work with them on some occasions. For the most part, though, it's best to let sleeping dogs lie, pun intended. Is this you? Is this you, Glasswalkers? Is this you? Yeah. I know this is in first edition, and when you get into second edition, they swear up, down, left, and right that they don't work with vampires anymore. That is a straight up lie that Giovanni bring you up by name. And I posted another page example there too. You see that one with the weird eyeball? Uh yes. That one is I'm well. pretty sure that I'm pretty sure they're referring to that I'm pretty sure they're referring to the Shadow Lords when they bring that up. That's Clan Buck Malkavian. Yeah. That that excerpt is wrong. You don't have to read that one out loud because I don't want to know what your schizophrenic friend for sounds like. But um Well no, my dude, my schizo if, voice would literally just be uh Anton Chigur. You listen to the you you like you, you can read on on screen on the Malkavians, but if you're working with the Malkavians, dude. Not the Giovanni is already a very dangerous clan to work with, but if you're teaming up with Malkavians, dude, you're gonna get people killed with that shit. You can't trust the Malkavians. We know from our game that Malkavians, they're not interested in any great goal. They just want to drag you down into their own shit. And there's below, but below that, I posted the excerpt from the Glassworkers first edition, where they have their little um, spiel about vampires. And do they say, yeah, we, we let some vampires live. We don't follow the litany. We let the worm breed wherever it dwells, wherever it breeds. And yeah, we uh, we know that some vampires are bad, like Clem, like Zemichi, for example, because I'm pretty sure the gloss, I'm pretty sure the Shadowlords would have spread the word on the Zemichi by that point. But and yeah, they bring up the Venture as a bad clan too. But if you're working with the Giovanni and the Malkavians, 
and two other books that I didn't post here, but Clan Bruja and Clan Gangrel. They don't bring them up by name, but they work with uh, werewolves too. Dude. Dude, are you serious right now doing this? Yes. I mean, vampires, that's not the worm. That's technically God's power, considering how Cain came into being. But there is no reason for anyone to trust you after you do this. I mean, hand in hand with the Giovanni is enough. The Giovanni, I th I've told you about their plot, is that they want to reenact the plot of Ghostbusters. And that comes up in their clan book, Giovanni. They say, it's not Ghostbusters. We thought of this plot before Ghostbusters came into existence. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they but dude, if you're participating in the Ghostbusters protection racket, you're not just a danger to werewolf society. You're a danger to the humans that you swear up, down, ref, left, and right that you're protecting. So I'm going to call these guys what they are. These guys are hypocrites, like more so than the Shadow Lords. There is no reason to ever trust a glass marker. And I I don't fully support the Red Talon notion of kill these guys on sight. But the Red Talons, I can't fault them on that either. Because knowing what we know about the glass markers, I you know the Red Talon, you're kinda of sort of justified in that. I mean I they're mean, granted, two, there are... the glass walkers at every turn are always two steps away from being wavered. Like, we talked about it in yeah. the Silent Striders episode where he said, literally, the, the glass walkers are setting up to be to the weaver what the black spiral dancers are to the worm. And I, I'm, that we're, we haven't finished the story yet because that's about to happen. Oh, boy. So, seeing that the entire tribe of the Iron Riders is about to collapse because around the time of the 1920s and getting Giovanni money... Now these guys are millionaires back when being a millionaire meant something like in the 1920s. These guys are now gunning each other down to death in the street where they are all violently protecting their money and have completely turned on each other. Cockroach immediately comes back from vacation, kicks Starbridge Lion out of the leader chair and takes over as lead totem of the Iron Riders. And forcibly changes the name. They say, Cockroach says, we are going to call ourselves Glosswalkers now. Because it's 1946. The television is start, uh, starting to be invented. The, the Sons of Ether already invented the television. So, you're going to join my Glosswalkers or you're going to die. That's the very simple order. And any Iron Rider who doesn't bend the knee to Cockroach is killed on the spot. And it's a pretty deadly time for the Glassworkers. They say, and I don't remember which book it is. It's I, I remember reading somewhere that the Glassworkers are the lowest in number out of all Geru tribes. And until DNA was made as a company, I believe that. Because that Civil she War combined with book. Cockroach's Culling. I think it was the Fiona book. Um, combined with Cockroach's Culling of the Iron Riders... That makes plenty of sense why these guys are the least numerous tribe, like lower than the Stargazers. Be but just, but just because of those conflicts alone. Well, the Stargazers aren't even really considered Garrow anymore. Because uh, <clears throat> even though you are a werewolf, uh, you the Stargazers left the werewolf nation, and um, it wouldn't surprise me if the Glossworkers were part of the reason why they left. Because they just saw how stupid and how pointless that entire civil war within the Iron Riders was. Yeah. And it's around this time that under Cockroach's leadership, the new Glasswalkers get even more rich. These guys are the 5% and a few of them are 1%ers. Um, not any millionaire I can name besides maybe Elon Musk. If I want to put Elon Musk, he would work as a Glasswalker. But definitely not Warren Buffett or anyone like that. No, they're they're Warren through and through. Yeah, and when Warren Buffett dies, he'll give all of his money to Jimmy Buffett. And they will make Margarita Land Part 2, and it will be a massive scheme. Yeah, they'll, they massive, will literally conquer scheme. the state of Florida. There will be no escape. Yeah. It's a fate worse <laughs> than death. <It's> stupid. <laughs> Wasting the Florida Rebels again in Margaritaville. Searching for my lost uh, round of M16. 
You may be wondering what's going on with the Boldy at this time. Well, the Boldy were having a tough time. I mean, yeah, they were doing the infiltration game too. They were jumping back and forth between dynasties, whichever dynasty was in power. The Stargazers became their neighbors. The Hakin became their neighbors. But the Manchus took over in the 16th century. And the Manchus started identifying Boli Jojihe uh, in the street and started killing them. So the Boli did a full tactical retreat to Hong Kong. And eventually the East India Trading Company would appear. And the Boli Jojihe immediately infiltrated that, seeing that as their chance to go from rags to riches. And it paid off. The British Empire extorted China with the opium and eventually got Hong Kong as an independent territory. And during the years of British rule, the Boli Zhejihe made so much money, dude. The glassworkers decided to call up the Boli Zhejihe and said, hey, you want to make your companies international? And they said, hell yeah, we do. And the money exploded between both tribes. Uh, if you have resources as a glasswalker, and if you're playing one in my game, I'd say, you know, you start off with a with a fat sack of cash, even if you have resources zero. If you want something within the glasswalkers, you got it. They have the money for it. They have the mages for it. Nothing is going to get in the way of a glasswalker getting what he wants. And this is what makes them the Tremere of the werewolves. Because not even nobody in the Camarilla trusts the Tremere. Even the Tremere hate the Tremere. But the reason why the Tremere are so relied upon is because of just how potent thaumaturgy is. That's the same with the Glasswalkers, where they have they have gifts that no one else uses that are deeply tied in with the Weaver, and they have all this money. I mean, if you need a benefactor, the glass workers have it covered. I mean, these guys are paying for the materials that the Shadow Lords are using to build their castles on the mountain. They're paying for forests that are being built for Red Talents to live in. They're buying weapons for the Get of Fenris and the Fianna. They're paying for the venues that the, that the Children of Gaia want to have their little conventions in, that the Children of Gaia want to have Anthrocon in. They're paying for the women's shelters that the Black Furies are holding. If you need something done in the Garo Nation, it is more than likely going to be funded by the Glasswalkers. And because of all that money, the Garo Nation needs to rely on them. Because the Garo Nation, majority of them have nothing. I mean, you look at the Bonars. The Bonars have no money. The Silent Striders have no money. Uh, if you follow Crow or Raven, so most Shadow Lords, you have no money. You just need Crow or Raven to provide the bare essentials for you. Not a lot of wolves have money, so you can see why the Glassworkers are so heavily dependent on. I think the only the only other tribes that would have businesses that they're never going to be as large as uh as the Glassworkers, but I think the only other business wolves would be the Fianna, maybe a Fianna? Granted, that's probably going to be a pub, and that's as far as that's going to go. More than likely. And a Black, Fu and a Black Fury. But those are the only two traps I can see having money. I mean, the Shadow Lords probably so, have, like, genera generational money. Yep. Um, that they stole from chopping the heads off of dead kings. More than likely, yeah. <laughs> and uh, what else happens around this time? The Virtual Adepts form. Uh, yeah, you get a second mage tradition joining you. The virtual adepts, who are all neo matri um, matrix mages, they split from the technocracy, and once again, the virtual adepts bring the glassworkers up by name in their tribe book, in, in their tradition book. I'm sorry, and of course, the glassworkers are going to cling to that, and with the combination of Sons of Ether and virtual adept technology. They have nuclear submarines built for them in the 50s, virtual technology in the 60s, fiberglass internet and electricity in the 70s. If you think of any sort of invention, the glassworkers are 50 years ahead of you in terms of technology. They have all this tech, and they're sharing none of it with the World of Nation. I mean, they'll pull some of it out when the Silver Fangs and Shadow Lords say, it's time to die, motherfucker, and then the Glassworkers will say, uh, but we have this and we can share it with you. 
and then they're persuasive enough to convince the Silver Fangs and Shadow Lords to let them live. But, dude, the resources and the contacts within the Glasswalkers, it's insane. This is the most powerful werewolf tribe. And we haven't even talked about the most powerful part. Have we? Kyle, what does, D what does DNA stand for? Uh, it is a very long chemistry term, I forget. It stands for Developmental Neogenics Amalgamated. Oh. I was thinking the I this, was thinking the chemical compound. This is a deeply weaver company in the world of darkness that specializes in gene therapy and cloning. You want a you want a new limb after your limb was permanently cut off by a silver weapon and you just couldn't heal it in time? Behold, the glass workers can make you a new arm made out of flesh and bone and slap it onto you. You want a baby even uh, as a menace? They can just give you that. You want a working pair of cock and balls? They can give you that. DNA is making new glass walkers and test tubes that are thrown out, and they are stronger than the war wolves that Pentex are making. Uh. <laughs> That's scuffed. It's against Mother Gaia, but extremely useful. And you don't even need material for this. Because they hire Sons of Ether and Virtual Adepts, you can just 3D print a living wolf made out of flesh and blood, and it will become a soldier for you. The Glasswalkers have gone from the least numerous tribe to the most populous tribe in a matter of days, in a matter of years. That's And that's not all. Fucking scary. That's not all. That's not all. You want to know what else? What do they got? They have Shinzui. So, you know uh, anything about Cyberpunk? The, t the tabletop game? Actually, no. I started reading the book, but I didn't get that deep into it. These guys uh, are... Either. You haven't read either? These guys are very much based off of Arasaka from, those, from the Cyberpunk games. Uh, Cyberpunk came out before World of Darkness, if I'm correct in saying that. And of course, Arasaka is this massive Japanese company that existed in Imperial Japan that has pretty much ownership in everything. I mean, they're, they're bigger than BlackRock. They control half the planet with their money. And that's exactly what Shinzui is supposed to be. The West may have Pentex, China, and Japan... And the rest of Asia have Shinzui. This is a company that is bigger than Sony, Toyota, and Toshiba multiplied by three and combined. Just name a Japanese company. They own it. What about Nintendo? Yeah, just any, any Japanese company Shinzui owns. And of course, it's all Weaver technology. So... You know what um, What kind of fun stuff the Weaver has access to? Drones. Do you want a wetware CPU that works like an EVA unit? That regenerates faster than a vampire ever could hope? That regenerates faster than a werewolf? That regenerates faster than a mage using the spell? You have drones. You remember, you remember me telling you about drones, Ryan? Yeah, I do. They're scary. Just... Uh, uh -huh. uh, Rege regenerate one point of aggravated damage per turn, per other person's turn. Yeah. You have ten. Yeah. You have ten people in initiative. That's ten points of aggravated damage that drone heals every turn. And these are the guys that help produce those. If you if you're aligned with the Weaver, it's a great thing because now you've got humans. Well, it's very very easy to make a drone. Because you just need to expose them to one song or get them possessed by a weaver spirit. And then, boom, the droning process begins. And I start thinking and saying more NPC stuff. Until eventually you have a Terminator. So, behold, infinite resources with Shinzui and DNA. But that's not all. You want to know what else? What's that? So, here I have in my hand, getting this up to the microphone so you can hear it. Here I have in my hand is an IMI torpedo. You want to know what this fires? A nerf, a nerf dart. No, <laughs> a small torpedo. This little pocket pistol is around the size of a desert eagle, and it will fire a small spike the length of your hand from your middle finger to your wrist. Do you want to know how much damage this deals? 
all of your aggravated damage? 12 points of aggravated damage. That's a one-hit kill for anything. For anything. This includes, like, if you crit with that's that, true. that's a Ferrectoy dead, if you crit with that. And along with that, this carries uh, eight bullets in it. Well, I, but you can't really call these bullets anymore. This is a spear at this point. It is a flechette. And you saw in our game the ASC-117, which is a 3D-printed machine gun that will fire just as fast, if not faster, than an MG-42. Where, sure, that's only a clip of 25 bullets, but, dude, one burst from that gun, and you just turn whatever you just shot into hamburger. It fires that quickly. That's terrifying. So you, so you can see why the Glosswalkers can't be dealt with. The Tremere are in constant fear th because they realize that even though they have thaumaturgy and blood sorcery and all the rights of the Hermetics, nothing they do is going to be enough if all the vampires decide to turn on them and invade their chantries. I mean, the Inquisition did that just fine in Vienna. The Glasswalkers, you can't do that because of how many toys they have in their arsenal. The Glasswalkers are so heavily armored, heavily defended, rich, and knowledgeable that the Gerber Nation just can't do anything about it. It has become a parasite stuck to the nation that even though it's benefiting you, even though you're getting a lot of good stuff out of it, it's become so big and so deadly, you will never get rid of it. And fun thing to talk about, times of judgment, that happens in Weaver Ascending. The Glasswalkers turn on the nation, and that that's an apocalypse scenario in of itself. The minute you get droned Glasswalkers attacking you, all the danger of the werewolf with a hive mind and that much of a regeneration factor, it, it's over for majority of the tribes. Some of these tribes are already low in numbers. They won't be able to survive that. The Red Talon's dead. The Stargazer's dead. The Bonars, who were supposed to keep an eye on the Glasswalkers, dead. Children of Gaia, dead. I mean, even the combined forces of the Black Furies, Fianna, and Geta Fenris, that's still not going to be enough to push back the Glasswalkers. You're going to need all hands on deck just for that one enemy. And for Forget about the Black Spiral Dancers. That doesn't matter anymore. You've got the Glasswalkers that dwarf the threat that the Black Spiral Dancers used to be. <laughs> Why not get the Glasswalkers to go kill the Black Spiral Dancers? You could. You could. It's just that the Black the Glasswalkers say, uh, no, we still got money to, to make. We don't own the entire planet yet. The minute we own the planet and buy the moon... Then we can fight the class, the Black Sparrow Dancers. Well, fucking hell, there's not going to be a planet for you to have cool toys and money on if they fucking kill everybody. And you want to know the even the best part of all? What? So I don't like a lot of stuff that 5e is doing. I think 5e, from what I've seen so far, just kind of sucks. Especially what they did with the Glosswalkers as a tribe description. Because apparently they just have a spurg out anytime they see technology get damaged. So if you drop your phone and the phone screen cracks, they go into frenzy. That's kind of um, ridiculous. Yeah, that's yeah. just a really stupid. That's just really stupid. Like uh, it's, I've already said before that Justin Chile just has no understanding of werewolf, and it's clear that his staff doesn't either, because nobody is correcting him. Nobody is saying this is what the Glassworkers were doing. Nobody's even reading the trap books, dude. They're just looking at the wiki for information and then just copy that verbatim. The wiki doesn't even have that much information on it, especially about Werewolf the Apocalypse. Like, I use it as just, like, a visual guide while we're doing these, but, like, yeah. I I read the tribe book pages that I, that, that I need to to get the info. I have a hard uh, time once again, the wiki. Once again, Werewolf 5th Edition was supposed to come out Christmas 2021. What what day is it now, present date? Uh, July 10th of 23. Yep. Yep. We're in good hands. We're in, we're in great hands. But they did one thing that I thought was pretty spooky with the glass markers. What's that? Cockroach is no longer their totem. You want to take a guess who is? Spider is. Yes. They're already weird. That's... I, I mentioned that in the Fiona episode. Yeah. yeah. And when... Dude, Spider isn't just a spider. This is capital S Spider. This is Queen Ananasa. That's the Weaver itself that is the totem. 
It's game over already. The Gloss Walkers just turned in 5th edition. Um, you know, it's great to put all this apocalyptic stuff in 5th edition when, you know, the point is to create a long-lasting product that can get a lot of replayability. It makes so much sense that you're putting all these in-game scenarios right in our faces in 5th edition. I can, I definitely see the longevity of the series now because you just killed the Sabatas of Faction, fucked up the Camarilla, turned the Anarchs into jokes. Created the, just balloon the size of the Inquisition with Hunter 5e. And the only two games oh, you'll be able to play after that are Hunter the Reckoning and Wraith the Oblivion. I fucking hate this running staff, dude. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's such it's such a joke. Just just hire fans, dude. Seriously, just LOL hire fans. Maybe they'll hire you. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. We bitch about uh, it no, enough. No, Maybe too... they will. Never say never. No, nah, but. But the shit we say in this podcast, no, I'm way too radical. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that's the history. Uh, story's over. Game over. Everything's over. The the glass workers now belong to Spider. Yep. Game over. Game over. Game over, man. All dead. Game over. Uh, camps. Let's talk about camps now. And I will bring up auspices uh, after we finish. Uh, okay. The camps. Uh, you Back, talk to bags a campers. We're going camping. So there are a quite a few camps of the uh, of the glass walkers. The first one I'm going to talk about is going to be the random interrupts. So the random interrupts are one of the mo one of the more recent tribes. They were founded in 1987 by Ragabash, B. Clarence Gilson, and Galliard J. Endurance Early. Uh, is that Earl or Early? They put an extra e there. Um, so the two met in 1986 while trying to develop a wide area network for the Glasswalker Currents to communicate using some of the first uh, uh, TCP IP protocols on SPAN and NSFNet. Very early, very early tech stuff. I, you know, as somebody that, that took A plus and is uh, and went to college for information systems, I find this stuff kind of interesting. Uh, so, Caveman technology. Yes, it is. It's great. So, um, how it started was first Gilson believed that there was a bit of a debate between Gilson and Early where Gilson believed that computers could have a positive effect on fighting the worm. Early wanted to minimize the damage done by the worm by denying it his tools. And so the two decided to form a pack around the idea of using traditional and spiritual techniques to destroy the worm, uh, fronts on computers uh, and they published these ideas in their manifesto called bug uh, called bug size wolves which acted which advocated random acts of destruction with no logic or prior intelligence uh very similar to like uh if anybody has read or seen the movie fight club very similar to project mayhem in that regard where they would go mm. out and they would break something just to say that they broke it because you, if you, it's you broken the are... worm can't affect it you know whose guys are very similar to? Who's that? Clan Bruja. Yes, they are very much the Clan Bruja of the uh, of the werewolves. Uh, however, I can definitely see these guys getting. I can definitely see these guys get along with Clan Bruja, considering that Clan Bruja, some of their um, templates they can play as. Some of those are crypto anarchists and hackers. Yes. Yes. I mean, in our vampire game, Ragnar was a was a hacker. That was his whole and, and yet thing. he. And yet he hated Electric Jack. That was his nemesis. That I did find that hilarious. <laughs> but we didn't know what Camp Jack was. The only thing is yeah. that he kept trying to kill us even after we paid off the blood debt. We killed the Fomori. DS, Ult DS Ultimate was his camp. Yeah. We'll get to we'll get to that in a minute. I'm gonna get to them. Uh however, yeah. while they initially uh gained some traction and even began to develop relations with the Cyber Dogs camp. Uh, it largely focused on the nature of identity computers, the future of the apocalypse. Uh, however, there was some pushback against it. Uh, most notably, uh, Elizabeth Jean Reader was the most vocal opponent of the camp, stating that you can't go to Gaia, which she's absolutely correct. You cannot, you cannot use technology to recreate Mother Gaia. Um, and there was sort, and uh... there was sort of an up. Uh, What's up? Uh, uh, oh, uh, but maybe you can. Uh, John's laughing at me. I imagine that that this is just him laughing at me being a Fiona Theorge who believes in Mother Gaia. Um, 
Virtual adepts. Yes, the virtual adepts. Yes, uh, you can make a new guy. Yes, so you can. <laughs> Gene Reader can. decided to look at Gilson's earlier work, suggesting that the computer should be used to find a solution to fix uh, to fix the current issues plaguing the world by the worm instead of trying to create a new one. Um, and in doing so, they uh, was aided by some strange anonymous benefactor who supported a direction with a single post that promised 50,000 US dollars to the first person to send a complete analysis of kin to garo ratios by the tribe over the last decade. And that analysis was sent within three weeks and the money was delivered. The tribe had been redefined and started a shift from just sort of ran random anarch anarchic hackers to, you know, a more structured hacktivist group. Uh, thinking of system potential and how computers can be used to serve Gaia. So the I'll, I'll say I'll say have anonymous. Yeah, but it's basically what they what they sort of became. So there isn't really a whole lot of structure to the organization organization. They're sort of organized around what the tribe calls uh, projects. And so people will sort of get together on these uh, on the Garo Nation uh, WAN network and sort of discuss how they can uh, how they can best serve Mother Guy with something like the 1000 Bane project envisioned to uh, analyze a large number of Banes from a diverse source using tech fetishes that can define spirits in numerical terms and then the spirits can be used to compare each other and all varying data can be discarded and find the common elements in order to find a numerical snapshot of the worm basically a predictive warning system to find out where and when and how the worm will attack next so See. most of this has been done by you know this random benefactor that keeps that keeps rewarding projects with monetary gain. The book has this whole uh, side section that, you know, just keeps funding it. Elizabeth Jean Reader was the first to, uh, was the first to get rewarded by him. However, we're, it's really entire, entirely uncertain to the tribe who this random benefactor was. Maybe it was Jean Reader, you know, trying to anonymously post in order to drum up support. Maybe it was a corporate wolf. And it could have been somebody entirely, somebody entirely different. Maybe it's even a shadow lord. God help them if it is. Maybe, maybe it was a totem getting a start. Yep. So uh, to be initiated, there really isn't an initiation. Basically, if you contribute your ideas to a different project for the random interrupts, then you're basically a member. There are some people that just kind of browse. There are lurkers they call you know, random interrupts to be or lamers at worst. And they just kind of, they just kind of float along with their random projects. They went from project mayhem to anonymous is what happened. So next. Speak. I think, wait, hold on, man. I think someone, I think somebody just uh, joined the voice. You hear this? Who's that? Uh, no. See, well, now she's, well, now she's shy. She doesn't want to say anything now. No, I don't see anyone. Let's see. All right. Well, well, now I'm having a difficulty, difficulty, because I was about to do something funny, and then the joke just didn't work. All right, what's the next tribe? Okay, sorry. Okay. Next, Speaking next of corporate funding, the corporate wolves. Lovely. Uh, they were founded in 1912 by a philodox named Bruce Harper. He drew upon Frederick Taylor's theories of system engineering and motion studies in hopes of covering tasks for the Garrow more efficiently. Uh, he Initially, he basically tried to work to reduce like um, reduce waste and productivity and ensure a packed turf responsibility, basically dividing up the different people within his camp in order to cover more ground with less time wasted. Initially, he started his operations as underground illegitimate businesses using extortion to bleed his enemies before taking up legitimate business reasons to interrupt the worm's operations. He basically did what what um, sorry, what's that what's that Weaver company called? Shinzui. Yeah, he basically does. He did back in 1912. What Shinzu does now is that he makes direct business competition to the worm and the worm's businesses, is what he's been doing. Um, so he then decided 
uh, to try and he tried to evolve the business naturally with a um, goodness gracious I'm losing my words with Schumpter's notion of creative destruction Pri tribe progress depending on the old being destroyed and then quickly replacing it and this mm -hmm. and this process achieved dominance in 1981 due to Brian Smitherman's who was a ragabash and he started to imitate vampire strategies by bribing corporate mm. officials and corporate media in order to help push the Garrow Nation's agenda. The only issue is that it works really well for an undead immortal who can just keep the money rolling so long as they live. It is a lot less useful to werewolves who can, who can die. And mm. so it worked for a little bit, but they realized that the major thing that... that the thing that they finally have been able to achieve was efficiency. So, as far as the organization... The corporate wolves use their money to make me. I am Digital Eye, the channel totem. Can you hear me now? Shut up, chat GPT. <laughs> You're a fucking... What is the next camp, Kyle? You're a fucking spawn of the weaver. Get out of my fucking camp. Oh, but don't hurt her feelings. I don't give a shit. She's weaver shit. Get her out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want her becoming any smarter. You understand me? The more data she has, the more powerful she becomes, and the more we get tied up in the Weaver, and the quicker we lose Mother Gaia. Get her out of here. Nah, she al she already reached the next level. It's un it's impossible to stop her now, dude. Fuck. Okay. Well. So basically what they, they do, as said before, is they work to subvert regular corporations from the inside. They either build they either build opposing corporations to the worm or they plant their own workers inside worm companies and basically tear away from them, similar to what they did with the uh, with the Catholic Church and also what they did with the uh, technocracy as well. So they biannually meet at secret locations called the fields and the people that come to this meeting have to be of great importance to the glass walkers you have to be invited by the the higher-ups brian smitherman colin jeffcott and big bills leo the book doesn't mm -hmm. really elaborate on well my section of the book didn't really elaborate on big bills leo uh can you mm -hmm. fill me in on who big bills leo is because i'm kind of interested to know Bi Big Bill's Leo. Well, uh, Ryan, who do you think he is based off of that name? Big Bill's Leo. Uh, I'm guessing he's a New Yorker who is a Bills fan. He was, uh, His well, the reason Leo. he's called Big Bills is because he got a shitload of money. That's why he's called uh, that. Uh, he sounds like he sounds like he belongs to this next camp I'm going to talk about. Let's talk about it. This is okay. So I feel like I should take on my proper voice for this part of the podcast we're going to talk about the wise guys and now eventually they say that the wise guys date all the way back to the middle ages working for the Maltese crime lords and they only existed as an organization within the last century no evidence there was no evidence to suggest that they link to the modern wise guys because the modern wise guys is distinctly an american phenomenon it was actually started by a single pack in Chicago in 1910. And it was actually derived from a joke that the pack alpha Gianluigi Luki came up with. And it was sort of based on the pranks that tendencies and the organization led by Johnny Torrio in Chicago. Now, Torrio never knew that the wise guys was actually Garrow, but he learned really quick that we were really good at getting messy jobs done really quick. Now, Lucci, Lucci learned from Capone's ability to make friends with people who are good at their job, regardless of nationality. Yo, Capone, he was friends with, uh, he, he married an Irish woman, he was best friends with a Jewish man, and made the best out of everyone's skills. And that was crucial to the wise guys. Now, mm -hmm. and now Lucci took that idea and he spread that to, the, to every glass walker that he met. However, this camp was quickly torn apart by a combination of the corporate wolves undermining their own businesses and the RICO Act. RICO, if you don't know, stands for Racketeering Influenced Corrupt Organizations Act. It's a bunch of bullshit mm -hmm. is what it is, and it tore this family apart. And the Italian government had a huge mafia crackdown all at the same time. 
The camp nowadays is a shadow of its former self. As far as Thank you, Rudy Giuliani. I don't remember how Rudy Giuliani talks. It, 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 that was, well, I don't think we want to do a Rudy Giuliani impression given how greasy he is. No, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> now, how this works is that it's basically what you do is you go to the Don's basement, you're surrounded by your Tubi brethren, and you read the camp version of the Omerta. You know, whoever appeals, to, whoever appeals to the law of man is either a fool or a coward. Whoever cannot take care of himself without that law is both. Ah, that mumbo jumbo. And, you know, you had the difference between associates and you had made men, slightly different to the mafia proper. Made men are full members of the camp, but they didn't have to be Italian. They do, however, have to be Garo. Kinfolk could only ever be associates and were rarely treated as well as regular associates. There were made women, but, you know, we don't care as much about them broads as much. So, basically, the wise guys are, they're the mafia. They are basically the mafia, and they are a shadow of what the mafia used to be. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, digital eyes taking some average with that. You should have said all that in Italian. Well, I'm sorry. I don't know Italian. I only know how to voice act. If you met our virtual adapt friend, we could have taught you that. Well, I don't want to, okay? If I'm going to learn a language, I'm going to commune with the ancestors and see if they knew somebody that spoke Italian. So, Ryan, we brought up that the Giovanni were very useful as allies for the wise guys. Yeah. You remember Dentis in our vampire game? <clears throat> yeah. What did he make? Uh, he made zombies. Exactly, and this is a... Massive, massive, massive taboo in Garo society. But there, even though I had that rant about how dangerous it is to partner with the Giovanni, nowadays you don't have to worry about that considering that the protection racket idea fell through because of, well, A, Cersei's Jones setting off the nuke, B, Ravana awakening, and then C, the Harbingers of Skulls popping up. Yeah. So now you can work with the Giovanni just fine, big deal, but. They are very useful in fighting Pentex, because I think I told you before about Enzo Giovanni. Uh, you might have. I have no recollection, yeah. though. Enzo Giovanni was planted on the Pentex board of directors by Augustus Giovanni, and then one day Enzo stopped returning Augustus's calls. Augustus calls and says, hey, where's my son Enzo? And the Pentex board just says, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know where his son is. And of course, you put two and two together, and then the Giovanni went from being one of Pentex's biggest benefactors to one of Pentex's biggest enemies. I think yeah. the Giovanni hate them more than Giru do. That actually makes so, that a, that'd be a great campaign, in all honesty. Yeah, sure. like like Lurt, that, you are going to take a massive hit to your glory, honor, and wisdom renown. But if you get the Giovanni on your side, they're probably going to ghoul you, though. So. Yeah, you're going to lose your soul, and you're probably going to lose all your gifts, and you're probably going to end up playing Vampire instead. More than likely. I mean, with, like, ha halfway through that game, we just pick up all your Garu sheets, throw them out the window, and then swap them out with Vampire sheets. But Yeah. The, the Giovanni are a very useful ally to have. I see why the Glassworkers got suckered in by them. Yes, they are. Also, okay. uh, What's up? also they have... Just as much money. Well, they used to have just as much money as glass workers did. Yeah. Who has the most money now? Now it's the glass workers um, or the mages. Uh, that would that would be um, the technocracy because the syndicate exists within the technocracy, and those are the guys that invented currency as a concept, and all of their magic revolves around money, and they can just magically inflate and devalue or increase the value. Of your money with the flip of a switch. Yeah. Huh. All right. So moving on from then, we have the uh, DS Ultime. Uh, yes. Johnny's very excited about them. So I love uh, these guys. They are sort of an offshoot of the corporate wolves, and it begins with a Cro Prandeheva military contractor, which is a PMC that was founded by mm -hmm. Robert Petkov in 1991. Most of the soldiers for uh, CPMC are just normal humans. However, all, most, if not all, of the officers are Garrow. 
Any of the contracts that mm-hmm. they take have to be within, quote, moral, ethical, and legal boundaries. And they use the money from the contracts that they take to launch attacks against the worm. However, uh, during an operation in, in, uh, in India... There was a huge disturbance, and none of the and none of the Garo that were sent out there to investigate had returned. This resulted in the, the loss of. The question was named Ravana. That was the Raptors and Tadaluvian who did that. Yep. So, in this, so f- because that happened, Petkov had lost one of his closest friends, and then fell into a huge state of depression, and eventually Hirano, and he was stuck in Hirano for multiple months until he met a stargazer kinfolk named Hashimoto Suki, who was a friend of one of Petko's subordinates, and Suki had this reputation as a really gifted healer and also had was prone to prophecy. And basically, her prophecies helped sh- help shake him out of Hirano, and he would eventually uh, grow to... He would eventually come to marry her. So after he heard of Suki's predictions of the apocalypse, he was convinced that the apocalypse wasn't forthcoming, but immediate. The rise of the random interrupts only fueled his fervor because he hates the shit out of the random interrupts because he thinks they're all just wasting time. So they tried to convince uh, as many Garo members of the CPMC that the apocalypse is indeed the next day or the day after over. So what they have been using is a lot of modern military techniques in order to try and fight the in order to try and fight the worm as effectively as possible. This makes the mm. Deus Ultima half doomsday cult, half mercenary organization, and they only offer nowadays uh, elite small scale forces for very short and delicate missions, as the as the company puts it. Uh, they try to incorporate approximately as many kinfolk as they do Garrow within their organization. The DS Ultimate does not initiate new number members as most Glassworker tribes do. Instead, they have more of a boot camp uh, based in Western Australia. To this day, the camp is growing very rapidly and have as many as 10 packs operating all across the world. They uh, didn't hold dominance at any point. But they are considered to have a strong chance to gain dominance over the Glasswalkers in general within the next decade. So they are a very new tribe, but they are also a very powerful tribe. They are the Ragabash of the Glasswalkers. Or, also, no, Arun, uh, Arun not you, Ragabash. You have seen, you you both have seen Milker Rising Revengeance. I've seen it, I haven't played it. Alright, so that's that is a pretty good hack and slash game all said and done. Ryan, you were gonna say something? Uh what was that again? Metal Gear Rising Metal- Revengeance. Yeah. I've heard of it, I haven't played it. We've all seen the all memes. Right, so just think of that. That's the DS Ultimate. I mean, I don't think just saying they're a mercenary company is enough. You're going up against cyborg wolves who have all those crazy suits that you see every boss fight in Metal Gear Rising use. Um, even if it's just down to Jetstream Sam where he's just wearing an exosuit and an arm. But this is the crazy technology you have to play with. And I'm going to go out and say it. I think these guys are stronger than the Gato Fenris. They just might be. They are an actual modern military Garo force. It's like in Civilization that... Six, if the, uh, if the um, Aztecs make it to the modern era. That is what that is what the uh, the DS Ultima are, dude. Not, these guys can at least take humans for uh, as contractors uh, for contracts, because I get a Finris. When you see the results of the get a Finris, it's going to be very obvious that that was a werewolf that killed that person. The Glasswalkers don't need to go into Krynos anymore. They have all these weapons. They own. They make their own tanks and helicopters. They can pretend to be humans and do all sorts of jobs. Just name any African, Middle Eastern, Central European conflict, and you can put a glass worker in that. And he will get along just fine. And on top of that, more money. Oh, more money. I'm rubbing, I'm, rubbing my finger, I'm rubbing my fingers together when I say that, more money. Texas A&M, the war... when gas hits $5 a gallon, everybody starts rubbing yeah. their hands together. 
big Lindsey Graham energy. Yes. Okay, now, <laughs> one of the most eclectic camps and one of the most hated camps, these cyber dogs. They were founded mm. by their alpha, uh, Gabriel van de Linden. They are very, they are very strong-minded and have very philosophical attitudes towards life. Carry on that tetra t- tradition of wax polishing lyrical on their web pages by posting song lyrics in their in their profiles on Garonet. So uh, they were the first tribe to begin incorporating cybernetics into the into the garo that were that made a part of them they believed that the world was that the world was bound to be made of machines and they wanted to help gaia make the tradition however uh like like the world had the y2k bug to see in 2000 the cyber dogs had elizabeth gene reader of the um of the random interrupts that directly opposed them and they and Elizabeth uh, Jean Reader basically tore the they tore she tore the cyber dogs a new asshole. She hated them, and they did some digging and found out that cyber dogs had forced cybernetic implants onto fifteen lupus garo, ten of whom had either died or gone insane from the chambers, from the changes. <laughs> and she proved that the heart of the scandal wasn't just a fringe group but supervised by their alpha Gabriel van der Linden himself. And so the entire tribe has been called for a correction, but that turned into a purge. There are about 20 cyber dogs who were murdered at the hands of their own tribe mates, and the rest of them were forced into hiding. They're pretty scattered nowadays. They're technically still a camp, and how to get in is simple. You design your implants, and then you have them implanted into you. The, mm-hmm. Still, the obsession within them remains is that they want to find out how to turn Gaia into a perfect, repairable machine. That's that's their and whole they, reason for being. And the easy solution is just get a virtual adept to the state of Archmage, and he then he can code an entire new planet for you. And then he just makes the Matrix, and all the Garrow can, can romp around there happily and in peace, just like one of the endings of Evangelion. It's simple as that. It's yes. simple as that. Just, Just give build all a new that one. money. Give all the money that you're making to the virtual adepts. And here's a picture. Look at this wolf undergoing surgery with metal organs in him. Thank you, Prescott. Very Graham, cool. Uh, Graham, let me send you that picture too. Yes. Put it, in, like, a, put it in the history fuck, pages. What the fuck did I call you, Grim? Uh, Ryan. <laughs> Well, because we're because we're doing the fucking because we're doing the well, we're doing the podcast. I posted it in history pages. Yeah, I called. I called Grim is also name. pretty badass as well. Grim is a good name. Yep. I Graham named, the, to to I named the slua that's in that's in uh, Freddie Mason's band Grim Scythe. So, nice. yeah. and then you. if uh, that's I'm not gonna ask about that. That's that's something for another. That's something for another time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's nasty as shit. Um, uh, Grim, would you like to undergo the surgery? Asking you in character. Uh, no, if I remember correctly. That is yeah. like $5 hose pipe from Home Depot in his organs. I mean, we can turn you into a space marine from 40k. We can make you 9 feet tall, 800 pounds with 4 hearts, and enough adrenaline pumping your veins 24-7 where you're always ready for a fight. Along with a natural regenerative factor and a ability to enter a um, hyperbolic time chamber of sleep, where you are fully conscious the entire time, but you get fully rested, so nothing is able to get the drop on you. Are you sure you don't want this procedure? Uh, given that Grim is a, I'm not gonna say pure blood, but uh, given his, uh... you were of Mother Gaia. Stay that way. Yeah. He he was bred for. <laughs> war against the worm essentially so and you he's gonna say and you can tell you can tell why this got such a big what the fuck reaction from the guru nation because you're kidnapping wolves and turning them into cyborgs the whole point of the cyber dogs is that they want to stop playing world of the apocalypse and they want to play cyberpunk instead basically yes yeah, that's the end goal. I think we have one more camp, and that's the city farmers, right? Well, no, we have uh, one more, and then one side note. Uh, 
the side note is how to rebuild the Trevs, right? No, it's not just that. It's the uh, it's the the nut jobs, otherwise known as the umbral pilots. We'll get to that. Uh, all right. Well, let's do the city farmers first because I feel like this is the one tribe, the the one camp that could redeem the glasswalkers. Yes, the city farmers. The city farmers uh, originated in 1971. Uh, and they began actually as the Kent State University protest against the Vietnam War. Trevor Goodman was actually an unchanged Garo until 1970, and after his transformation in 71, became devoted to ending urban expansion uh, in 1973 with a uh, idea he called Random Guyan Explosions, which marks the foundation of the camp. And over the next 25 years, these packs engaged in the use of rituals that caused plants to just sprout up and grow in very unlikely uh, locations. He strongly encouraged mm -hmm. the use of hydrophonics and other technology to do so. Basically, he wanted to turn the concrete jungle into an overgrown green concrete jungle. Now, for the initial part, it was dismissed as a joke by the rest of the glass walkers until, uh, as, until his main rival... Asta Lungdal, I think I'm saying that right. Lejungdal, mm -hmm. I think that's it. Argued mm -hmm. for uh, mm -hmm. Paolo Soleri. That is, if you could grow food within the city, urban expansion could just be an old farmland to save the wilderness. Basically, what you'd see in a lot of solar punk is that every single building has a rooftop garden where you know where animals can thrive and the wild can remain, while underneath is the concrete jungle. And this mm -hmm. gained a lot of traction within the Glass Walker because her suggestions seemed very sensible and practical and won respect of a lot of the tribe. Now, uh, Goodman is a bit more of a radical, despises uh, Lejungda's ideas of Palo Solari and continues to use Gaia bombs to this day. Uh, for this camp, there is no official initiation but you need to be able to have some way to prove yourself to be useful. You need to have, you know, a new technique for for growing green in urban areas. You There's mostly through academic or practical applications, either essay writing, doing extensive research into environmental science. Uh, however, Asta, Lung, Asta Lejungdal actually hopes that the camp will die on its own accord and have created enough documentation for a workable system to sell it to the corporate wolves for them to market and popularize it to the rest of the world. So, so probably the only redeemable you, one. You have seen that stupid World Economic Forum idea of the wall city in Saudi Arabia? Yes, that's all the inevitably to going to just plants. completely fuck itself. Yeah, where are you going to get the money for that shit? Oh, from everyone else, obviously. Yeah. So certainly not for the people that, that sit on that succeed. forum because they like their they like their hundred twenty foot yacht and their private jet to fly to all their to all their climate accords. The the reason that will never work is because they don't have city farmers with them. The city farmers make that plan work. I mean, um, I'm thinking about. I wish I had this image saved ahead of time. There was early concept art for Naruto. Um, where Naruto's room was just filled with plants. Like that grew up to the ceiling. That's what a city farmer's uh, house looks like. The entire house looks like that. Basically like Poison and, Ivy's house from from uh, fucking, what's it, the insane. Harley Quinn show. Yeah. And speaking of Poison Ivy, um, Black Furies tend to do that with their plants. So if you want a Glass Walker Black Fury uh, sister, uh, what, what's, what's the female version of a S uh, Sorority? Yeah, if you want that, that's a perfect way to do that. Have your glass worker be, the, be a city farmer, and then just pick any Black Fury camp, and it will work. Yep, Black Furies are very strongly a uh, wild-associated uh, tribe. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and the and then weird we have the, the Stooges, note. the Umbral Pilots, the date of origin, <laughs> the late 1800s. Uh, I'm gonna just read out the book for this because it's kind of funny. Hearing just the, the fear or hearing the fear in the narrator's keystrokes. So, 
When writing about the Umbral Pilots, it almost feels necessary to type random words in full caps and use many exclamation points. The Umbral Pilots began from a disgruntled tribe that felt the Glasswalkers weren't looking far enough. The Penumbra was merely a, fle- a reflection of this world and they wanted to find new ones. So they created bizarre Umbral transport vehicles and dedicated the entire machines to themselves powering it across the near realms and even into the deep umbra with nothing but their own love and devotion to Gaia. And over a century, they haven't stopped these basic activities. They meet exclusively in country manors or gentlemen's clubs or the sports bar around the corner. And joining them means building your own machine. Don't join them, please. Let them die. I don't enjoy talking about them. They're nuts. What's What's funny is that they got the idea from this from talking to the Sons of Ether. Yeah, and that they do it. There's a Sons of Ether group called the Adventurers that do the exact same thing. Wait, wait, who? Yeah, yeah, the Sun. Yeah, they got the idea from the Sons of Ether, the, the main tradition. Nice. Yeah, so you want to jo- go and run off with these guys who want to. Die in style like Amelia Earhart. Uh, do that. That's your prerogative. We'll stay home. It's like that one gif of like a dude like eating a burger, and it's like crabs at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean eating Amelia Earhart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and uh, while we're on the topic of weirdos that you get to talk to, uh, Ryan, you've been quite this whole podcast. I'm feeling bad. Let's do relationships now. Yes. Relationships, okay. Yeah. We have I'm just three camps. Sitting right. and listening, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoying the podcast, you get to see this before anyone else. Right. Yeah, there you go. We didn't even have to sign up for Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. Which we'll never make. No. Uh so the three camps that I'm gonna be getting into is uh I guess representing of us. But since um uh, mm-hmm. John's doing glass walkers, I asked him what he wanted me to or uh, discuss, and he said Black Furies. So it's going to be Black Furies, the Fianna, and the Geta Fenris. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start with the uh, Black Furies. I have the thing I have right here. Mm-hmm. That one? Yes, that one. So from what I read in the little page that I got, the Black Furies, uh, they, Glasswalkers find them respectable. Uh, as well as one of the few who, and uh, I took this quotation, give a damn about humanity. Mm-hmm. They say that they are a mix uh, with of uh, brutal, uh, brutal violence with genuine mercy and care. Uh, with few to go as far as to help some of the Furies uh, try and change women's treatment in third world countries uh, with financial funding. Mm-hmm. Uh we're going to be going into the Fianna next. Oh, and wait. Hold on yeah, yes. I have a lot of stuff to say about that. Oh, All boy. Right. So, something I keep seeing, I saw this in the Rage Across the Internet server, and I had to break sound on it before Grant Kaysen, who isn't a fucking mod in that server, came over and tried shutting me down. And, uh, fuck you, we continued that conversation in DMs. Um, <laughs> so... Something I keep seeing get pushed onto the Black Furies. I'm not saying this with hate in my heart for anyone who's transgender, but that is impossible for you to make a Black Fury who is trans. That will never happen. That is in the books. We'll talk about we'll talk about that more when we go into the Black Fury episode. But that is impossible. Being a Black Fury, you need to be a natural woman to be in the Black Furies. But there is room for a trans wolf. If you want that, the Glasswalkers are the tribe for that. I'm going to post in history pages. Don't put this on the screen, Kyle. All right. Because with the black, because with the Glasswalkers, you want your you want your genitals to look like this. Guess what? They can team up with DNA, team up with Shinzui, team up with any of the virtual adapts or the Sons of Ether, and they can give you whatever kind of genitals you want. I mean, uh, forget about gender fluid. You can just be whatever. With a with a gloss walker, you can make it up on the spot, and it will exist. Do we like what we see? Yeah, it don't look great. Yeah, these are inventions that you would never get from Gaia, but you can get with the Weaver. 
So if you want to go into the the T Babe direction with the gloss markers, this is the this is the tribe for it, not the Black Furies. Um and of course the gloss workers are going to exploit this because whenever the Black Furies are having a little feminist rally, a woman a little woman's march, uh, the gloss workers are over to the side with little flags saying, Hey, if you support women's rights, give me five dollars and I'll sell you this hat. They're basically can, like it, well, it's like Raytheon having a rainbow flag is what the glass walkers are exactly, doing. Exactly. They're at the Children of Gaia Pride Parade selling them rainbow flags. They're at the Fianna Pub selling them little St. Patrick's Day hats. Uh, they're selling nuclear launch codes to the Wendigo. Uh, granted, the Wendigo <laughs> aren't willing to put with that much money yet. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to. If you want to make a fourth wave feminist werewolf, that would work with the Glasswalkers. I don't right, know the third wave that. ended. The that's new to me. Yeah, the third wave ended, and we're going into fourth wave, dude. Oh, I've been behind. up. I haven't been paying attention to the to the things that people bitch about. I've just been focusing on lore. So anyway, you don't spend your you don't spend your spare time flaming people like I do. Oh God, no, no. Who is the time for that? <laughs> me. <laughs> I'm glad somebody does, because that shit's just, you know, <laughs> stressful. I don't want to fucking deal with that. All right, Ryan, you were talking about the Fianna. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Fianna. Uh, well, surprisingly, both the Geta Fenris and the Fianna, they didn't have really much to say. I mean, you know how they say words are worth a thousand words or some shit like that? Uh, yeah. In pictures are worth a thousand Picture. words. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the paragraphs weren't very big. But the the actual what they say is like heavy. Mm-hmm. So for as far as the piano go, they go as uh, they go on to say that the piano are nothing more than uh, Garo who painted themselves blue and charged with no discipline onto the battlefield. Disease was rampant because they lived in muddy squalor, and that their descendants today are. Uh, the descendants today who include the Fianna aren't beautiful, fey, conversing poets. Poets. Can't speak. <laughs> but they're short-tempered soccer hooligans. I resent that. I don't even like soccer. They also <laughs> believe that the Romans are greater than the Fianna. Oh, I got some fucking words, my guy. <laughs> You, uh, you, you are going to go to war with these guys when you beat them in a, in a werewolf Oh, fight. you got to fuck it right. Look, if it weren't for the Romans, we'd still have the White Howlers around. And the girl. Exa- exactly. They see nothing wrong with the Roman Empire. <laughs> That's the they, fuck thing. They go on to say when the Celts had their day, the Romans had already got uh, started getting uh, the idea of sanitation, modern roads, and useful things like aqueducts. And that their armies were advanced and well developed. So, are you telling me that the gloss workers are telling the Fianna that they deserve to die? Eh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that <laughs> they just didn't think it was worth helping. Hey, at least the Wendigo out and out said they wanted to kill all of Fianna. But no, the glass walkers had to be shifty about it. You were both here when we did the Fianna episode. How many times did I bring up the word glass walker when I was talking about the Fianna? A ton. Yeah. Zero, because the glass workers were sitting in the Roman uh, Centurion lines laughing at the Fianna the entire time. You mentioned them a couple of times, I think. Yeah, laughed. Yeah. Uh, no, Silver Fangs. Yeah, the yeah. Silver Fangs. It's oh. always the, we always talk yeah. shit about the yeah. Silver Fangs. The, the glass walkers, yeah. I don't think they brought them up at all, because... We were busy. So, look, look at these fucking guys. Look, look at them dying. Look at them. You were laughing st- at your own kenfolk, you fucking idiot. Is that guy throwing stones? Oh. <laughs> I passed the mutton. I gotta see more of this. <laughs> God, I hate the glass walkers. <laughs> Alright. We're doing the Gethenris next, right? Yes, Gethenris. Uh, they really didn't say much about them it was they think we're absolutely better than uh Fianna. um oh, come on <laughs> i'm just gonna read the whole paragraph because like i said it's not much Do uh, it. it goes and now you're expecting me to deliver the same verse as for the Fianna. 
spell wrong. The get offenders may be bloody, fangs and claws, first warriors, but they're coming from civilization that were their master craftsmen and had brilliant <laughs> ships. And hell, in a way, my old camp are pre, uh, pretty much similar to them. Violent, but very focused on family and respect. I'm not a fan of their lack of tact, but there's a lot more similarity between our tribes than they think. I wonder how they'll react to DS Ultimate. DS yes. Ultimate is going to put them out of a job. Yeah, they are. Unless the Get Ephemeris just join, but I don't think they will. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Get Ephemeris, I think they enjoy getting gore in their fingertips too much to, to pick up a gun. Probably, yeah. Um, granted, you got a really fun guy. We are going to do an episode on Rage Across the Amazon in the future. There is a guy who could get along great with the DS Ultimate. It is... Uh, his name is Golgol, and he is the Gelafinris War Master in the Amazon. And this guy loves war more than Lindsey Graham and Jeb Bush combined. Um, he wants the war in the Amazon to go on forever because he just enjoys killing corporate pig soldiers that much. He's literally like Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore from Apocalypse Now going, One of these days this war is going to end. Yep. And I don't want that to happen. He just kind of sits and thinks about it for a sec. Yeah. I love the smell of warm guts in the morning. <laughs> and who doesn't? <laughs> and if the military industrial complex has proven us anything, the DS Ultimate would love to sell them some guns. Well, yeah, I mean, we 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 basically spent uh, most, like, two sessions ago putting fucking... Uh, what was it? Nostrum. Yeah, Nostrum Mart out of a job. Yeah. Um, as now that I would like to talk about auspices. Uh, wait, no, 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 no. I'm going to hit myself. What's that? Would you like, uh, Ryan, would you like to read that paragraph on Vampires of Yeah. Uh, did you want me to go over the Anani, uh, Ananasi as well? Ananasi, or, that's going to that uh, leave that after the vampires because the Ananasi is going to twist the knife. Gotcha. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, this is, uh, bear with me. This is going to be a little bit of reading. I took a read through it earlier. Um, mm -hmm. let me just clear my Sit tight. Let your mind relax. Let's see. Supposedly, Let's do it. our tribe's traditional enemy, and to take a large degree, that's a true statement. I'm going to make your word that you don't find them outside cities. I spend most of my life in cities, and wouldn't you know if that's true or not? Oh, sorry, and wouldn't know if it's true or not. Yeah. However, mm -hmm. just about every city I've ever been in has a few of the leeches. It's a greater truth in Europe than elsewhere, though. America has a lot of vampires, but very few of them have any great influence. And those few that do are obvious about it. It doesn't mean they're not dangerous, but it means we know how to avoid them and when to not avoid them. Mm -hmm. The worm went all out with vampires, though, because they're some of the most versatile and clever servants it has. Mm -hmm. My personal guess is that there are a refined Fomori, one that has the bane properly integrated into it, allowing the host to move around despite being dead. That integration doesn't destroy the host's mind, uh, so they don't become easily dismissed cannon fodder we normally deal with. Either way, they're probably our number one enemy in Europe and a lot of trouble in America. The one advantage we have is that they don't seem to be as cohesive as we uh, they would like and fight amongst themselves almost as much as we do. One thing's for sure, we learned hard, painful lessons about bargaining with them. Don't trust them, not even for a second. Roger Daly did when he made the treaty with them in Vancouver 30 years ago. He, as well as the entire sept, paid for it with his life. You can kill them. Uh, if you can, kill them on sight. And a Vancouver book that was never released, so we never got the full story on that. Yeah. Uh, do you believe any of that? After Absolutely what we talked about. Absolutely not. 
You say avoid vampires at all costs, and that that didn't stop you from working with the Giovanni hand in hand from 1920 to 1990. Nah, not really. Nope. Books full of same shit. Same with the Malkavians. Same with the Gangrel. Same with the Bruja. What aren't you telling us? What aren't you telling us, uh, Glasswalkers? How many vampire tribes have you, uh, vampire clans, have you worked with that you're just not telling us? Because. I didn't look through every vampire book. I, I did run out of time for that one because I spent too much time reading Kindred of the East to make sure I was getting the Boldy Zoji right. But, dude, I can definitely see the Asimites, uh, the Battle Hakim, buying weapons from DS Ultimate to, that, that are specifically designed to kill vampires with, by shooting them. I can definitely see these guys working hand in hand with the Bruja for the same reason. I can see them taking in gangrel vampires and harboring them. I can see them giving temporary plastic surgery or like fake like dark man movie skin to the Nosferatu so they can hang around in public. I can see these guys selling art and buying art from Toreador. I can see these guys buying stock in Ventrue companies. This is a straight up lie that they're telling you. Yeah, the uh, none of what they say is true. The Glasswalkers are the consummate capitalists of the Garo Nation. Yeah, the the Shadow Lords will tell you it's your own fault if you take me at my word. You're, I would trust a Shadow Lord before I would trust a Glasswalker. I wouldn't trust either of them. I say that as a Glasswalker. Yeah, yeah, you can't even trust your own kinfolk. What's that say? Now nah, that's why I say these guys are so similar to the Tremere because even the Tremere won't trust other Tremere. This is why you're hanging around with a Fianna and a Get right now. And to squash the testicles into the ground, read the Ananasi. Alright. You want me to read the full thing or just a summary? Full thing. Full thing, you got it. Ananasi! I have it on good authority that they exist, supposedly. Uh, they're spider shifters who can turn into very big spiders. Though just how big tends to vary between size of my fist to large dog. They feed on human blood, and they're all supposedly aligned with the weaver. It is it is that last fact that scares me. Witless. Think about it. If they feed on humans, then they're not living out in the country where they don't have anyone to feed on. They're living here, in a city. And despite the fact that we're weaver aligned, and we're allegedly the weaver tribe, Put that in quotes. I've never seen one ever. Sometimes I'll see a spider and I'll step sideways to look at it. It's never an an Anasi. There are a lot of spiders in the city, you know. The Ananasi, by the way, if we remember the War of Rage, were the prime target of the War of Rage, because the Garu knew how dangerous it would be to let the Ananasi live. And not only are the Ananasi still alive, but they are working with or spying on the Glasswalkers. And if we're following 5e, Spider Esser Totem, they are now working alongside the Ananasi as kin. Well then 5e is fucked already. Absolutely. It's this is why I say it's game over. It's game. It doesn't matter what you do. The Garo Nation is completely fucked because you had your chance to crush the Glasswalkers in the 1940s, and you passed it up because you were distracted by the storms of Hi Swords of Heimdall pocket watch that swung in front of your face, and you just let the Glasswalkers go right under your radar and become a threat bigger than Pentax, bigger than the Worm Colts, bigger than the Black Sparrow Dancers. Bigger than the Zemichi, probably bigger than the Antediluvians, given how much technology from the democracy that these guys steal, it's over. It's over. I, I, the reason there are so many issues with the Geru Nation, why they haven't won, is because they're so damn stupid because they keep electing our runes as leaders, the most violent and deranged people they could possibly get to put in a leadership position, keep getting these roles, and you don't have anyone smart enough to recognize the real issues. We really don't. That's why I'm a theorist. No. No, got, this is uh, why... Yeah. my boy Grim. This is why... <laughs> yeah, this... <laughs> Vote for Grim. It... Make the uh, even if you again. guys, even if you guys fight and you kill every member of Yale University Underground in our game, 
it's not going to do anything in the grand scheme of the Weaver. You just took down one company that could easily be, re be replaced. Because not only could you just clone all these guys again, but their memories are hooked up to a server that the virtual adepts helped create. That their memories will just be uploaded directly into those clones. So you have an entirely new Vinny Blue Box Zeke Hotspur that's ready to fight you all over again. So what you're saying Did is you... the game we're currently playing is already fucked. You weren't a big Dragon Ball Z fan, were you? No, I, I didn't watch a lot. I didn't stay up late enough to watch Dragon Ball Z when I was a kid. They they have a, a movie called The Return of Cooler. That is exactly what I'm describing. Cooler dies in a previous movie. But because he partners up with the big Getty star, which is this massive machine, he's able to produce an infinite number of clones of himself that overwhel overwhelm the dragon team. And it's not just a cooler, it's coolers, plural. You have so many dangerous enemies that are getting cloned by DNA and having their memories directly uploaded into those clones. You can't beat the Glasswalkers. It's impossible. You want to worry about the Actena. You want to worry about the Shadow Lords. That's a distraction. That's Caesar Circus, which they know how to play because they were in the Roman Empire as politicians when the Roman Empire existed. Masterminds, dude. Masterminds. They've, they've won. They've yeah, won. Our, so our werewolf game is already hopeless. Yep, it's already hopeless. This, there's a reason why this game is so commonly compared to Warhammer 40k. In the grim darkness of the future, there is only war. And now we can talk about auspices. Yes. All right, so way. it's very easy to explain. Uh, we pretty much gave away what, a, what an all room glass worker would look like already. Just imagine any cybernetic soldier. Think um, as small as Rick Deckard from Blade Runner to as overtly powerful as Raiden and Santa Armstrong in Melgar Rising Revengeance. Nano machines. That's son. what. I mean, you look at Melgar Rising Revengeance, that's all you need as reference for Glasswalker Arun. Yes, um, indeedy. Yeah, because you can just explain that easily, I think that's it for the for the Arun part. Uh, Ragabash. Uh, this is your little hacker who's going into Fort Knox and stealing money and then distributing it amongst his kinfolk. This is your benefactor who is stealing from the rich and giving to um, himself. The Wolf of Wall Street, as it were. It, exactly. If you are looking for a conniving, backstabbing businessman, this is the kind of wolf that you want to play as. This guy is perfect for the corporate wolves. And as you know, these guys are uh, typically your pranksters amongst werewolf circles. Uh, imagine what kind of prank you would get from a Glasswalker Rangabash. Uh, haha, I just uploaded gore and CP onto your, onto your hard drive. Enjoy the IAA investigation. I was going to say they just downloaded a virus directly into your computer. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So, think of your internet trolls. That's a perfect example for the Ragabash. Um, they hate the Antichrist. They probably just, they okay. probably just leave him. Yes. <laughs> they probably just leave normal people alone. But they definitely go after anyone who's got a LinkedIn account. Make Pentex make make Pentex Cucks Colt uh cope and sieve. <laughs> uh your Theurge. This is the one and only camp that sees no problem talking to Weaver Spirits. This includes your pattern spiders, all variants, including the big damn net spider, which is a boss fight in and of itself with the same regeneration factors as a drone. Um, if I remember seeing the the picture of one right in the Ratkin book, those guys were equipped with machine guns. So it's so. a spider mastermind from Doom. Oh yeah, all the fun little cyber demons you can call from Doom. The, you're calling these with the uh, Glassworker Theurge. Imagine just how deadly some of these Weaver Spirits can get. And also, um, electricity spirits are typically Weaver aligned. So, behold, as your Glasswalker calls an electricity elemental and then shuts down the entire power grid for a city. All Imagine how fun, fun that's going to be. Yeah, pretty rough. <laughs> I the, feel the like syndicate... that'd, that'd fuck up the, uh, the uh, Glasswalkers as much as it would anybody else. It would, as long as your guns don't operate off of batteries. Makes sense.
the, the Phil Docs, your negotiators, these are the guys who are going to the virtual adepts and the Sons of Aether and convincing them to give them all these fun toys. And on top of that, we haven't talked about them that much, the Knockers. We're going to do an episode on some, uh, some of the changelings uh, very soon. The Knockers are guys... Oh, sorry. They're changelings who are Semitic clowns. Uh, that's the best way I can really describe them. Who build stuff that works because it says they work. So you will have a gun that has, like a shotgun, that has five barrels that all fires at the same time that you need to reload just by shaking it. And they will give that to the glass workers to play with. That I always and... imagined like playing that would be so much fun. Like just a really old one that was friends with Oppenheimer. It's like, oh, you know, yeah. the atomic bomb, I accidentally dropped a stick of gum in there. And then I used to <laughs> connect these two wires and then connect the ground to a piece of the wrapper and stuck it onto the bubble gum. And what do you know? It still worked. Peter, I can't believe you let John get stuck in a nuclear reactor and now he's going to turn into Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, these, these are guys who are getting, getting all the connections. You will have all the connections if you are a Glasswalker Philodox. And these are the guys who are also convincing the Werewolf Nation that they're not a threat. Yeah, but we're not planning on just completely overtaking you under the guise of Weaver tyranny. No, no, we um, we're we're still your friends. We're we're still your friends. Just don't worry about anything. Just don't look over at our buildings and all these tanks and planes and jets that we have stuffed in our hangars. Just don't worry about that. We're still on your side. Andrew Galliard, uh, this is the most normal out of all the class walkers. Uh, Kyle, you like heavy metal? Yes, very much so. You like pu you like punk music? Very much so. EDM? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Trance? Not really. Uh, yeah, Ryan just posted a perfect example of a uh, Phil Dox Glasswalker <laughs> meme chat. Yeah, pay no atten pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, is what we're looking pay at. Pay no attention to the sp pay no attention to the giant spider about to bite your head off. So, these are guys, these guys are pretty normal, but at the same time, that Brewhawk comparison that we made before, when you're a Galliard, you have five starting rates. These guys are pretty pissed off to, be get, to begin with. So, you're less Jack Black in uh, Tenacious D, and you're Johnny Silverhand from Cyberpunk 2077. Wait the fuck uh, You need me Samurai. to explain it. You didn't play Cyberpunk 2077. No, I did not, because it was still broken so, and my PC can't run it. I have uh, Fo Fox uh, tells me that this game runs great now because CD Projekt Red is only ever giving patches to the PC version. That makes sense. So, so now the game runs fine, but Johnny Silverhand in that one is this alcoholic lunatic who, after he performs a concert... Plants a nuclear bomb in an Arasaka building and blows it up. Uh, and at the time, didn't care about whatever collateral damage that would uh, that would cause until the operation went wrong. But you are the most politically driven artist that ever existed if you are a Galliard Glasswalker. You are intentionally going out to make a point. You are intentionally spreading propaganda through the internet. You are trying to get as many people on the Weaver side as possible. And something fun you're doing, you're sneaking one song into the stuff you post online. Uh, what is one song? That is either... There's two interpretations I have as to what one song sounds like. It is either the best symphony that humanity is capable of creating, or it's white noise. You're sneaking those notes into your songs, and you're exposing humans to that, and it's making drones. So, what does that say about me being a Glassworker Galliard? Uh, this podcast is either incredible or white noise. Yeah. D don't no, d please pay no attention to the red pill I'm slowly shoving down your throat. <laughs> I can't. I'm choking <laughs> on it. <sighs> uh, it's funny you uh, say and that. Would this make... Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, at the top of the Glasswalker tribe rights, there's a, uh, a quote by Cypher from The Matrix. 
I know what you're thinking, because right now I'm thinking the same thing. Actually, I've been thinking it ever since I got here. Why, oh, why didn't I take the blue pill? <laughs> <laughs> Would this technically make Gigi Allen a, uh, a Glasswalker Galliard as well? It, w- it would. That's kind of based. Yeah, you're also writing crazy books like uh, Snow Crash. I don't um, even know what that is. Uh, Sean can tell you about it. It's one of his favorite books. I'll, I'll ask him later. Yeah. And um, Arun. I think oh, wait, that no, there's for auspices. Uh, to very quickly go through the breeds, uh, there's only one breed, Hamid. Uh, we didn't bring up breeds in our Sonic Strider podcast. We, not because we forgot. It's because it doesn't matter with uh, breeds, uh, with Sonic Striders. They all functionally act the same. Uh, there are, out of the tribe, I think only 5% of them are Metis, and 5% of them are Lupus. And typically, those are treated as mercenaries. Those are typically put in the DSA array. Uh, that, well, I say DSL. I was thinking of something else, DS Ultimate. But majority of the members of the Glassworkers are Hamid. You can have a Glassworker Metis, you can have a Glasswalker Lupus, but majority of them are Hamid. Uh, they are convincingly human. You would have no idea that this guy's a werewolf until he changes before your eyes. That said, they are pretty low in Gnosis, so that's why they rely so heavily on other technology, namely guns, to fight against a weaver. And speaking of gifts, uh, come up with anything. We typically leave gifts out this channel because we want you to come up with them on your own. Don't go off of what's in the book. You can just make whatever. Go crazy with it, and not just that. The Knockers and the Sons of Ether and Virtual Adepts are selling them stuff. Give them a Sons of Ether Death Ray. Give them a Sons of Ether Force Field. Give them a Virtual Adept smartphone where you scan somebody with it, and then you have little sliders on the phone that influence the size and shape of the person that you just scanned. And you can just easily shut down a combat encounter with that. You will have to start rolling a ret, though. Um, the antenna, no law sorcery, and I think you should add an aret meter for the antenna. Add one for the glass workers too, because there is no reason for them to not use mage technology unless they are a Goliath. And I am done talking. Uh, Kyle, would you like to go into gifts? All right, gifts time. We like we like gifts. Everybody likes presents and shit. It's Christmas time in the Garrow Nation, and today we're visiting the Glasswalker's house. So, let's start with gifts. So, uh, I noticed that a lot of the ones that I saw here were specific to a particular camp. And the first one I want to talk about is a rank 4 get, uh, gift for the wise guys called the Umbral Motorcade. Now, a motorcade murder was the mafia equivalent of a drive-by killing. The idea was to be gone the moment after the deed was done. Uh, Gianluigi Lucci always felt that this never went far enough and came up with the trick of never being there in the first place. This gift allows the wise guy to shoot a victim in the physical world from the Umbra. A rat spirit teaches this gift, a fact that made the gift unpopular in some quarters. System... The Garo fires a gun at the target as normal, but the player should spend on should spend one will point, willpower point and no, emerald gnosis difficulty equal to the gauntlet in the arena. In effect, the wise guy is making the bullet reach across the umbra, so normally three successes are needed. Should the target be immobile for some reason, such as being asleep, then one or two successes might be sufficient. Since the target is probably unaware of the attack. Most attacks made with this gift are at point blank range and are probably lethal. That if you need, if you need to get rid of somebody, use the Umbral Motorcade. Step sideways while they're out getting the smoke. Walk right up behind them and put two in their head. I think that's cool as shit. This is very handy if you're working with the Giovanni, because the Giovanni are certainly going to need some guys dead. Yes, and. This is the perfect tool you can use to put somebody from Pentex di- down because majority of people from Pentex are pretty squishy. If you're looking Talking at a big about. wig, yeah, they the, don't use the, such well, a I... <laughs> So yeah, yeah, we we definitely don't work with the Giovanni wing. Not at all. What what would ever yeah. give you that idea? Okay, next we're uh, gonna. Uh, what's up? 
I was going to say, um, that there's a reason um, Earthblood did get something right with uh, the villain of it. Uh, he was so forgettable, I don't even remember his fucking name. But there's a reason you never fought him, and that's because that was just some dude at the end of the day. You could break him in half over your knee. <laughs> so just walk up behind him, use that gift, a boom, Indron just lost their CEO. That's pretty great. Simple as. Okay. Next, uh, let's talk about the random interrupts again with their rank five gift, phone travel. The random interrupt can effectively reach into a telephone line and emerge on the other end. They must first dial yes. the number of where they wish to arrive and someone must answer. A pattern, a patter spider teaches this gift. After the phone is picked up, the random interrupt rolls gnosis, the difficulty being the local gauntlet. As with stepping sideways, three successes are needed to transmit instantly. If fewer successes are rolled and the other side hangs up before they emerge, the Garrow is spat back out at, her, at their phone and takes three levels of lethal damage. Very high risk, very high reward. If they manage to roll three successes, you're there in an instant. Like, if you get a CEO's phone number of a worm company, you're there instantly. But you have to roll three successes. So make sure that you make sure that you abide by your gish if if need be. Do not do anything to fuck up your rolls. And make sure you are on full health and you are ready to get into a fight as soon as you're on the other end. Because this is a really great gift for infiltration and even better for assassination. See, I got a gift for this. I'm posting this in meme chat. For in meme chat? Yeah, I don't think you've ever seen Ghost Dad, but yeah. <laughs> oh. No, I haven't. Yeah, that's ex that's exactly what this gift does. <laughs> yep. <laughs> See, and, and what's great, in our vampire game, Electric Jack, your nemesis, Ragnar's nemesis throughout that game, you want to know why he kept teleporting behind you? Because Ragnar kept checking his phone? It's not just that, but I think this would have become even stronger in the digital age with, with Wi-Fi calling. Because now you can just teleport from everywhere. You don't even need a power line. You have voice but over IP, as long as you have a Google account. You were wondering why you never saw Eileen throughout the entire game after her one appearance? That's why she was the one making the calls. Oh, fancy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this is... Well, once again, you're noticing that a lot of these gifts are based around assassination. Yes, they are. Okay, next one I thought was really cool and really ties into the fact that they are buddy buddy with a whole bunch of the mages. It was here before. Where the fuck did it go? Uh, I hate losing my. I hate losing my notes. It's great. It's there called we go. Buying a ray gun. You can buy one right now. All right. So, this is just a general rank four glasswalker gift. Tractor beam. The Garo can transport non-dedicated objects with them to the Umbra when they step sideways. They may not take a living creature, only objects. The gift is taught by Weaver Spirits. The Garo spends one willpower point for each object brought over to the Umbra. It must be something they can carry and must weigh no more than their own body weight. However, two or more Garo with this gift can team up to carry larger items into the spirit world. Despite its name, the user of this gift does not emit a beam. And so if, if you ever needed to like hoist up a missile and then teleport into the into the to the umbra like a bomb or something, you can use this to bring a bomb into the umbra and then kill what's ever in the whatever's in the umbra. You, you can do a Cersei's Jones. You can be part of the technocracy. Yes, that's what this gift is. This is more technocracy shit. Mm -hmm. Let's set off a nuke at the Shadowlands. It sounds like a fun experiment. Yeah, it sounds like something that they do. It's definitely not going to wake up an antediluvian. Don't worry about it. Yes. Uh, here's one for our good old buddies, uh, PETA. I mean, the Cyber Dogs. Uh, Steel made flesh. This is a rank two Cyber Dogs gift. Sometimes it's useful to take a step back in order to facilitate many steps forward. An example would be in airports or other places with metal detectors. This gift allows the Garo to exchange all cybernetics in their body back to flesh. While flesh, cybernetics do not operate. A snake or cicada spirit teaches this gift. The cyber dog spends one gnosis. The cybernetics become flesh immediately. The gift lasts for the rest of the scene. 
I think that's interesting that they understood how taboo what they were doing was that they literally made a gift to revert to a flesh form. I think that's and just, cockroach. What and cockroach sanctions it. Cockroach gave the seal of, appro seal of approval on it. Absolutely. Dude, dude, this is why this is why I was quite about before, but the cyber dogs, absolutely not. They're not, they are not in hiding. They're not in hiding. They got Operation Paperclip. They have been sucked into one of every tribe, every camp of the Garu. And you can't prove me wrong because they're doing this. And with how dishonest the Glassworkers have been this entire book. They're absolutely there is, just diving in. There is no chance that there's no cyber dogs around anymore. No, there's yep. cyber dogs everywhere, and this is why. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Jean, uh, fucking Jean Ender didn't do shit. They said Jean she Reader, did she shit. didn't do enough. No, no. she absolutely they, did not. Now they're running amok. If you want, if you want to call the Tremere on that, you could have gotten something done, but no. Yes, and now your <laughs> episode of Mad Men. Uh, takeover, which is a rank five corporate wolves gift. Uh, what you he what you wear determines your worth as a human being in the modern corporate world. If you live outside the business, you are a number with a dollar sign in front of it, re representing what you own and how much it and you are worth. For business, you are what your you are your possessions, and this gift makes it literally true. With this gift, the corporate wolf can attack and physically destroy another person by destroying their possessions. A money spirit teaches this gift. The system. The player spends three rage points and rules strength and enigmas with a difficulty eight. The number of successes needed is determined by how long her opponent has owned the object. If he only bought it today, five successes are needed. If he's owned it for less than a month, four successes. While if he's owned it for at least six months, three successes are required. Finally, if it has been owned for over a year, only a single success is necessary. Assuming the role is successful, the corporate, role, the corporate wolf may proceed to make an attack on the object, and any damage done to the object will also be inflicted upon the opponent. The damage still applies to the object, however, and if the object... Only applies to the object, however. Emphasize that wrong. Great. And if the object is destroyed, then any connection between the object and the opponent is destroyed with it. If it still stands, the corporate wolf may continue to attack. If a corporate wolf obtains your priceless Ming vase, you should be all right, but worry if they ever steal your car. So they can literally kill you by breaking your shit. Yep. If they walk into your house and they you chuck your respect. Xbox out the window, they can kill you. That's fucking wild. I you thought that's hilarious. To be fair, if my like expensive PC gets destroyed, I'd uh, yeah, yeah, my like, life is over. This what this means is that a corporate wolf could literally go into like a Pentex Weaver house for like a dinner party or something, light the house mm. on fire, activate this gift, and make him like have a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then they do the gust fring, adjust tie, adjust glasses, walk away, don't turn around, don't look it, at the mess. Yes. Takeover <laughs> is a busted gift. Yeah, hopefully that sound clap wasn't too loud coming from my phone. No, no. I was talking over yeah. it because I thought the gift yeah. is hilarious. Yeah, so do you notice something too about these gifts that so many of them are camp dependent? Yes. And before the spider came in and killed cockroach and forcibly took over the class walkers there was hope because those tensions from the iron riders didn't die so many of the glass walkers have their own way of doing things down to individual levels where members of a of a glass walker pack won't fully agree on something so so many of them will go their own way uh down to the camps having exclusive gifts that they refuse to share with anyone because look at these gifts how many of them are accessible by anyone else uh so far um one of tractor beam is available to everyone else um web walker virtual umbra yeah i think those yeah. there's a couple of, there's oh weaver's eyes is another one encrypt yeah overclock 
Call of the City's mm-hmm. Wolves and Song of the City Beast, G- Gaffer and His Crown. There's a couple of them that are mm-hmm. that are just Glass Walker gifts, but a lot of them yeah. that I've read are dependent on being in a part of a certain camp. The uh, yeah, and this is why because there was a chance that the Glass Walkers could collapse again and have another civil war again, and then the issue would just solve itself. But nope, Spider came in. So there goes your little last hope of the glass workers not making anything of themselves. So now it's either Gehenna or the apocalypse. Yeah. Or um, becoming Weavered. I- I'm not even sure what apocalypse by Weaver would be called. I-, I read Times of Judgment. I'm still not sure. I don't know. What was the, um, what happens when the fucking, what were the, what were the technocrats of Warhammer 40 K? What were they called? Uh, Adeptus Mechanicus. Yeah, it's like when Adeptus Mechanicus finally went to Mars and learned the truth about it, and then he tried to remove the cyber implants before it was too late. But it's already too late. Graham, Graham would you like to look like um, Amica, a little AI uh, figurine where your body's made of metal, your brain inside of a machine, where everyone has the same silicon skin, everybody has the same text-to-speech voice, everybody has the same routine, everybody has the same state-sanctioned job, nobody ever gets promoted, and you're the same thing forever, and you never die? Because that's what the Weaver wants. Didn't Hu- Isn't that technically Huxley's Brave New World? Yes, the, the Weaver is the ultimate control freak. The Weaver is Brave New World. Yeah, the Weaver wants everyone to stop playing with their toys forever and wants to s- spray glue everything in place. That's what the Weaver wants. You can't play with my toys. I will play with my toys by myself forever. And the rest of you that's, are that's... all the little doll people that run around within it. Yeah. Ryan, you only have three rights. Would you like to do them? Uh, sure. well, I have five rights. Yes. There tri- um, there's three tribe rights and uh, two camp rights. Do the two camp rights and pick the tribe right that interests you the most. All right. So we're going to start off with the camp rights. We have two of them. We've got the bonding right and the right of growth. A bonding right. Uh, I'm just going to read what they do instead of generalizing because I didn't read them. This mm-hmm. is a literally named right. Uh, this literal... This literally named right is quite simple, but it's absolutely crucial to the entire camp's uh, some paperwork. Um, Paper notes. You yeah, can do right. it. Uh, uh, no, uh, Discord went off and I got distracted, so I lost my spot. I hate no, my... Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm uh, doing you this too. Yeah. It's crucial to the entire camp's understanding of modern Garou tactics. This right temporarily binds a number of kinfolk into a pack, asking the pack totem to accept them. To perform this right at a length of surgical, uh, right, a length of surgical thread is passed through the knuckles of one hand of each pack member and prospective kinfolk. Every kinfolk must stand next to at least one Garu, which means at least a third of the expanded pack must be werewolves. If the gap between each hand, in the gaps between each hand, a steel charm in the shape of a glyph is hung from the surgical thread. The two ends of the thread are tied together to form a circle. Following this, the right master cites, recites a prayer to the pack totem three times, speaking a more co- speaking more incoherently each time. At the conclusion of the last prayer, each member rips their hand away causing the surgical thread to rip through their skin. The thread will remain embedded into the uh, right master's knuckles. She then wears the ring of the thread like a necklace. From now, she is the linchpin of the pack. If she dies, the effects of the right vanish. So system, on a successful casting of this right, all kinfolk in the right receive the same blessings from the pack totem as the garrow and may use the pack tactics with them. This effect lasts for one scene. That's very useful for bringing your kinfolk up to the level of uh, werewolf, but uh, doesn't sound very Gaian, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> and, and then we got camp and, of the... 
I can't, I can't right of growth, sorry. City um, farmers. So, bonding right was Camp uh, Dias Ultimate, right? Ultimate, mm. right? This one's Ultimate. Camp City Farmers. This right is remarkably back up measure for traditional city farmers, allowing them to cause plants to grow in strange locations. The plants do not grow unusually quick, but can grow in plastic, concrete, or other unusual places. Drawing nutrients from the source, three garro are needed to make this right work. The right master makes an indentation in the, sur in the surface using a claw and plants a seed, uh, plants the seed of the plant into it. The three then hold hands in a triangle around it, kneeling, and request the spirit of the material that it nurture and care for the plant. If the spirit agrees. A green, or uh, a small green shoot will appear immediately. System on a success. Uh, Success on this right means the plant survives for a month, growing at a normal rate. Afterward, it requires water and care like any other plant. That's kind of sweet. Right. And then that plant says, "Feed me," and starts killing people. It's a me. It, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about that. D I know how you feel don't about that. In, don't post any memes, chat. I'm gonna scream. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> yeah, but it is a mean green but, mother. Uh, but it's not from outer space. It's from you know a bottle yeah. of coke. Yes. <laughs> like the the fucking the fucking uh shitty farmers are basically just like I want to I want to give the world a coke and and keep it company. Yeah, or you can go with a nice version of this and have this be the plant that Wally tries to protect and Wally. Yeah, that's what the city that's what the city farmers are basically. They are the Wally yeah. of the Glasswalkers. Yeah. And it's it's a shame that these guys have to follow spider now. Yeah, because they were the only the the only redeemable glass walkers. The only de the only decent people in the whole tribe. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, Ryan, General I think there was Wright. one more. Yep. Uh, I'm debating whether or not I want to do Memorial Day or Promethean Days. Uh, Promethean Days is referenced a couple of times in the in the reading. Let's go with that. All right. At first glance, this right almost appears generic. A uh, week of feasting and cleansing isn't unique to the Glasswalkers. But look at uh, when we hold it and the reason behind the right becomes clear. The Promethean Days happens right at the end of the year, along with human celebrations like Christmas, Kwanzaa, Chinu Chinooka? Hanukkah. No. Ha <laughs> Hanukkah. <laughs> Sometimes it's Chanukah, but it's Hanukkah. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you, Ryan. I'm, just... <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I never realized there was a C in Hanukkah. Well, no, it, there's, it's it's a second spelling. It's like some people spell it Hanukkah. Some people spell it Chanukah. It's still Hanukkah. All right. So, human celebrations like Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, and, of course, New Year. Uh, we are often called the tribe of man and this right certainly gives some weight to the moniker the right breaks down in two parts the first part is marked by gluttony and as a result tends to take up most of the week we eat drink fight and make love to kinfolk in theory to our heart's content during that time we are supposedly work to throw off our limitations it all happens through conversations. Old grudges break down over wine and dinner time conversations. Uh, find a f informality that lets us find simpler ways of operating. The right master rolls wits plus ritual, difficulty seven. If a simple success is achieved, all participating Garu recover all willpower to face the new year. Which is My great. About to that. That is great. That is the best way to get you out of Hirano. Yep. Everybody, yep. gather yep. around the table. We're going to eat like a motherfucker. We're going to drink like a motherfucker. We're going to beat the shit out of people. And then we're going to fuck. And everything's going to be great. Yeah, not not with the Fianna, by the way. That's uh, a damn the, shame. The, but also, the glass workers are looking are better. The glass workers... Are, the glass workers are looking Tyler in the eye while they're kissing a, 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 kissing a Black Fury right in front of them. Oh, the fucking lucky bastard. 
<laughs> oh, they won't be laughing and when they when they're covered in what when they're covered in webs. And we have six totems to go over. Yes, let's do it. Totem time. So, it's kind of set up like a like a company in a way. If you want to imagine a cockroach being like like this like Cal, Calvin Coolidge, um, chairman of the Glasswalkers. I sent you something that pretty much summarized what each of the um, what each totem technically is in terms of their company position. Uh, it, did you? Or is it that? Uh, yeah, no, it's in our it's in my it's our DMs. I can pull this up. Yeah, so looking at what we've got, the chairman of this company, so to speak, is Cockroach, and of course he's this sleeming, skeezy, uh, sleazy, disgusting vermin German who is definitely not thinking about buying Pentex companies from Pentex. Um, he definitely wouldn't do that. Don't trust this guy. He is expensive. He has seven background points. If you take him as an individual, the Chosen of Cockroach will subtract two from all difficulties involving computers, electricity, and applied science. They can also perceive the contents of data streams in the Umbra. Along watching... Um, it's the same as watching a YouTube video or listening to a cell phone call, just sitting completely still without a screen, at a Gnosis roll difficulty 6. The pack as a whole will gain three dice to any roll that will activate in terms of activating a gift involving technology. The ban. You must never kill a cockroach. Uh, I like That's the how, fact uh, that the trivia on the wiki says, in all caps, wait, the cockroach does what? In W20, there is a wormish breed called the Samza, a rare cockroach, that instead of killing, cockroach decides he wants to make a part of the Glasswalkers and starts teaching them fucking gifts. Great. Y yes, well, that was such a great decision to bring this guy back. <sighs> Starbridge Lion, Star I wish you ran the company into the ground. He probably uh, should Speaking have. of Starbridge Lion... Starbridge Lion is your president, who used to be the CEO before he did such a bad job he got demoted back to president. As we said before, this guy's a train. I posted in uh, history pages what these totems look like. This is the only tribe book I have seen post pictures of what the totems look like. So, you see that monkey and you see that old man? Uh, yes. That old man is Starbridge Lion when he's not a train. Nice. Yeah, so that's him. And that's Monkey King right beneath him. Yep. Uh, Starbridge Lion. Individually, he believes in distinctive personality, but also a firm sense of social responsibility. So everyone in his pack will gain an additional die of charisma, as well as plus one to etiquette, as well as lending some natural speed and plus two athletics. You will also gain one point of temporary honor. And a pack can call upon three additional points of willpower per story. The ban. Starbridge Lion demands that you will never touch a car or a motorcycle. You can use boats. You can't use planes. Well, you can. He just would much rather you not go into a plane. You must do I mean, all your traveling by train. Boats are just trains on water. Yeah, basically. Yeah. What does he want me to do? Hoist the sail? Yeah, on on rails by the wind. Amazing. So, yeah, so Starbridge Lion has kind of sort of fallen out of style, but there's still plenty of class walkers that will follow him. Uh, granted, I think he needs to change his name to Bullet Train and kind of sort of reinvent himself. I mean, that might that might be the only other thing that saves us. Yeah. Uh, next up is Monkey King, who might be the only nice totem. Uh, this guy seemingly cares about humanity. He is the company director who really ought to be the chairman. Uh, get Cockroach out of here. Put Monkey King in the director's seat. Uh, Ooh, so wow. Monkey King is ex he is expensive, dude. Eight background points. That's, that is the same level of Bull. And Bull, you saw that stab block for Bull. That all the rage you get from Bull. It's nuts. So this better be good. So... He will give you Blur of the Milky Eye and Open Seal immediately when you take him. 
and you will receive a minus two difficulty to all evasion and escape rolls. It is very easy to dodge attacks with Monkey King. You may also purchase Doppelganger at level three, which does exactly what you think it sounds. And speed of thought, as if it were a Glassworker gift. And having learned under the Taoist wizards, the Monkey King is an excellent teacher, and his students may purchase abilities with one less experience point than normal. Jesus. How does that sound? He, he's literally Rafiki. Yeah, yeah no, well, I was going to say this guy is Sun Wukong, yeah. who died and became a totem. That's in the book, too. He's, he is Sun Wukong, but now a totem. And the ban. Monkey King is a rebel spirit and demands that his students never stand for curtailing another one's freedom. Although he allows for imprisonment of the servants of Centipede, which is what he calls the worm, he will not tolerate forcing a spirit into servitude within a fetish. You will never touch a fetish with this guy. This also includes human rights, as he is fond of glass workers interested in political causes such as freedom of speech or of oppressed peoples. The Monkey King also never forgets the monkeys whom he first ruled. His students will lose honor if they abandon someone they have befriended or are responsible for. That's a lot of requirements for a ban. I think that's the most requirements you have you have to follow, Albany Totem, I've seen. True, but the traits are absolutely nuts. Yeah, that's three different that's three different bans, but the stuff you get from following Monkey King. This is so much stuff, and you already know how useful Blur of the Milky Eye is from seeing Reynard in battle. Yes, absolutely. Next up is one of my favorite totems. Um, this isn't my favorite favorite. That would be Griffin, but this is Clashing Boom Boom, formerly known as Minerva. And Clashing Boom Boom is a literal stealth bomber, dude. Hmm. <laughs> if you summon an Incarna of Clashing Boom Boom, a small RC stealth bomber will appear on your arm with all the weapons of the real thing. And just because they're smaller doesn't mean they deal less damage. It is brought up in the, in the um, Gloss Walker's first edition book. Clashing Boom Boom bef uh, was a stealth bomber in the 40s and was going around German battlefields gleefully blowing up Nazi Germans with all of its bombs and all of its guns. What was it, like the Deutschland Dorito? Exactly. <laughs> If you want somebody to kill some Tremere anti-tribute, you call Clashing Boom Boom for it. So, what Clashing Boom Boom will do, also expensive as hell, eight background points. Uh, Clashing Boom Boom will add one of their, uh, will add one to your firearm and melee skills, and the mass maximum difficulty with any weapon would be a nine instead of the max of a ten, and she will ask that. Uh, her children will name all the weapons and ornaments in some fashion. You must name your guns when you use Clashing Boom Boom. And if you are using the Rite of Binding, you have a minus one to all difficulty involving making fetish guns. And she ensures that all of your guns will never malfunction or jam. Meaning if you want to kill that child of Gaia, you now have the gun to do it. <laughs> and the ban. Clashing Boom Boom expects that her powers will only be called upon to expense righteous justice. Those who follow her call must um, never harm the innocent. You must always be a force of justice when fighting for Clashing Boom Boom. I mean, that's actually not Man. bad for a war totem. And also, I'd just yeah. like to say, like, naming all your weapons, that's just what my, my Blood Hunter does in my 5e game. Exactly. Because <laughs> I've got Mr. It's Big out. Stuff, the thirty out rifle. I've got the I've got what's the what's the six shooter that I got called? It's just called the six shooter. I think we Yeah, I think we just call it the six shooter. Yeah, and then I've got the I've got but, the nail rifle called the bad news, and now I've got rolling the Tommy gun. Brock, Fred Brock. He's got uh two Tompas that he's named Fred and Justice. Yep. So you guys are already you guys We're already following Clashing, following, following already, clashing Boo Boom. We didn't even know it. Yeah, but you don't have the you don't have the tone points for it though. No, we don't. I yeah. put as many of them as I I put all of my stuff into my totem just because I knew that it helped us a lot in the game. And this is why I like the DS Ultimate so much because this is their totem. Like they love Clashing Boom Boom more than they love Cockroach. That's probably good for them in all honesty. If if only Clashing Boom Boom would leave the company. 
Well, yeah, they left. Um, the, I mean, like, it, I'd rather have Clashing Boom Boom than than the Spider. And now we get to talk about the CEO and CFO of the company. We have Almighty oh Dollar. <laughs> this is totem. Uh, granted, because of current events, the power of this totem has diminished considerably. But there is still value in following Almighty oh Dollar. Uh, pretty inexpensive, background cost of four. All roles involving commerce have a minus three difficulty bonus, dude. And all Garo with this totem will gain two dots in resources automatically. You just get paid by taking this guy's your totem. The ban. You must only ever use American dollars in any sort of currency exchange. So... Because of current events, this guy isn't as powerful as he used to be. But we have another totem. If you don't like American money, you can use this lady instead. Easy credit. Uh, if you look at the pictures, it's the guy and girl standing next to each other with Clashing Boom Boom behind them. Yep. All right. So easy credit. Uh, background cost of four again. And pretty so Well, actually, it's identical. Uh, minus three difficulty bonus to commerce and plus two dots and resources. But you must use every currency that isn't US dollars in commerce when you follow easy credit. So if you want to make a crypto anarchist, this is the person you follow. And you can see why the crypt why the corporate wolves became so insanely rich. Because they just got money that fell right into their laps by taking both of these totems. Yes, they do. You want to get paid, you follow these guys. Mr. Beast follows this totem. Now, there is an, an unofficial 7th and 8th totem, too. Uh, now, because we're going to talk about it, we're going to talk about Digital Eye. And Digital Eye, I would have had her read this all out, but you don't like her, so I'll read it for her. <laughs> No weaver shit in my podcast. <laughs> Alright. Background cost six. It's a little expensive. But Digital Eye will give you the blur with the milky eye. And Digital Eye will offer a plus three in computers, plus three in security, a temporary honor renown. But if you're not a glasswalker, that will instead be an honor loss. And the thing is, Digital Eye, you must carry something digital with you. Because Digital Eye doesn't speak, it's all text-to-speech whenever you talk to Digital Eye. However, because AI is very topical at the moment, that would also entail that you are in constant communication with your totem if you take Digital Eye. So, dude, I we have Bacchus walking around in our Black Fury game. Imagine just how convenient it would be to have Machine Messiah. Um, no, no, not Machine Messiah. Digital Eye with you, who is, in lore, a satellite that the Glasswalkers shot into space and can see everything on the planet. I think Judas Priest wrote a song about that. Th they did, and now you can use it. It's actually my favorite Judas Priest song, hilariously enough. And I slept up what the eighth totem is, Machine Messiah. You remember we mentioned Machine Messiah at the start of the video? Well, here he is again. Machine Messiah... We'll give you the gift Control Simple Machine. And each pack member who also uh, who takes them will receive two bonus die to any extended or resisted intelligence roll. The ban. Children of the Machine Messiah must do everything they can to advance the coming of machine intelligence singularity. They must also work to prevent human mages, the technocrats, and the worm from controlling machine intelligence. So basically, it's Skynet. If you, if you want the most extreme Weaver totem, you go with Machine Messiah. And something I'm like, like kind of sort of close the video on. I always do um, relationships and uh, tribal flaw. Uh, I told you about Ion before, and you didn't really get it before. Yeah. Yeah, the Carl Jung book. I don't. I haven't read it yeah. still. All right. So he has the, uh, the the hierarchy of the of the self, where I am that going one. to okay. copy. Yeah, I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste it in history pages. 
All right. Yeah, uh, h here we go. Uh, to very simply explain this model, hopefully the embed loads. Uh, I can go to the go to the thing. Yep, I got it. Yeah. So the top of that is the most human you can be. The bottom of that is the most mechanical or immaterial you can be. And the philosophy with the Silent Strider, uh, but, but the I keep saying Silent Striders because I have them on the brain. I love that trap. <laughs> the Glasswalkers. The Glasswalkers. The thing with them is that they were in the Serpent um, part, where the Serpent isn't evil, even though it is the Garden of Eden's Serpent that caused the fall, but you use the venom of a Serpent to make medicine. It is something that is both evil and good, and that is where the Wars of Men sat. They saw humanity, they saw technology, and knew that that was a, to a tool that could be used for both evil and good. But as time went on, and their fascination with technology grew, they slowly started sinking down that model. They are now between the two bottom squares. And with Spider, they're about to get dragged down to the bottom, where the travel flaw with the Glasswalkers is plain and clearly, you're going to lose your humanity. You're going to lose your individuality. The Weaver is about to completely take you over. This tribe is one day away from getting droned. And causing the apocalypse. And the thing with the glass workers is it's already too late. If you take any of the cockroaches brood as your totem, if you talk to the spirits, if you talk to the weaver spirits, it's already too late for you. You're exposed to one song. It, because it's no longer cockroaches brood, it's spiders brood. It's like we've been saying, it's game over if it's, you're a glass worker. It's over before it's even begun. And there the is weaver, a... Toyed into our webs. It's already too late for you. I can't help you. And, it's, and neither can your ancestors. Slim chance that the Guru Nation will be able to fight these guys because they became so insanely powerful in such a short amount of time. And now we talk about mixing splats. Yes. So Mage is yeah. the obvious choice, as we've said uh, multiple times throughout this. And there's a entry in Book of the Weaver where these guys hate the Tenecracy. They ultimately want the same thing under Spider. Uh, Cockroach, these guys were crypto anarchists who just went their own way. But now that Spider's in the pilot chair, they want the same thing, but the glass workers want the Weaver sticker slapped onto it. They're both deranged authoritarians. Just the, the technocracy want a pro human fu future. It's pretty bad when the technocracy is the better of the two alternatives. Yeah, so like I really don't think the glass walkers know exactly what they're doing to themselves, and they won't know until it's too late and they've already lost their individualism. It's just like it is with, already. Yeah, it's just like it with Adeptus Mechanicus. Because... Tear out the implants before it's too late, and it's already too late. And, it, and soon and late for me because of how many times I've been augmented. I mean, I've had allergy shot therapy when I was ten years old. I had my eyes um, given LASIK surgery. I had a myotomy. I had a, my chest was caving in so deeply it was touching my heart when it was beating, and I had to get a pectus bar put in my chest and flipped out. Uh, it's too late for me, dude. I've already been augmented. You hear? You heard it first. Johnny is of the Weaver. Yep. It's not even. Um, it's not even mechanical implants, dude. It's as simple. It's as simple as getting a vaccine that will get you infected with one song and Weaver taint. Uh, something, something, COVID pandemic. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Brought to you by Pfizer. Nope, we're not. We're not part of the Church of Saint. We don't get sponsored by Pfizer. Nope. Okay. Uh, uh, other mages. Well, it, it's plain and simple. Sons of Ether are virtual adepts. Put them in. Put them in. Yep. Put them in. They're talking with them. They're talking with them. They get brought by name. Put them in. And of course, uh, uh and of course, you have vampires as well, especially the Giovanni. And our ongoing matchups of Werewolf versus Vampire, to recap what we've done so far, Biana versus Setite, yes. Wendigo versus Banu Hakim, Donald Charter versus Malkavian. We are pairing the Glasswalkers with the Bruja for this one. Yes. Because the f when they had when they were the Iron Riders. They were very, very similar to the Bruja. We could have paired these guys up against with the Tremere, but no, we got another pair up with the Tremere later down the line. With how the Bruja, chaotic, good. 
that if you want to make the Bruja good guys for a change, because th there's nothing good about the Bruja. The Bruja want to be portrayed as these ultimate heroes. And, ah, uh, uh, Ryan, but don't worry too much. We'll go about the end of the episode. And the yeah. Bruja... The Bruja keep wanting to portray themselves as these ultimate heroes. They, they're not, and they never will be. But in the face of the Glasswalkers, they probably can be. Uh, the Bruja are so political and so passionate that it's gone into derangement. And looking in the face of a corporatocracy that's about to take over the world, that's the Bruja's calling. That's what they're pulling this world for. Every Bruja's going to look at that and say, this is what I was put on this planet to fight. Let's go and fight some Glasswalkers. You've made a perfect enemy for the Bruja by just existing as a Glasswalker. Yes. They are uh, the consummate changeling. anarchists, and I think there's enough chaotic Glasswalkers in order to match that level of chaos that the Bruja will bring right. to your game. There was some DS Ultimate that are um, not going to cause any war crimes, but won't consider Danger Close to be a, an issue. Uh, two, what's it? What's a couple, you know, 200, 600 meters of heavy artillery between friends? Uh, changeling. Well, first of all, these guys are banal as hell because they are <laughs> controlled by the Weaver. Mm -hmm. But the Knockers don't see an issue in that. As we said before, the Knockers will build technology with the Glasswalkers and say, Hey, does this, this, does this look cool? You want to use this? And they're buddy-buddy. Kind of, sort of. Until, of course, the corporatocracy apocalypse happens, and then the knockers are going to have to eat their words. Um, Wraith, actually. Really? You can make a crossover with Wraith. You... There is a, there is an official World of Darkness game called the... Um, I think it's called the Orpheus Device, where somebody in the Orpheus group, which is a little faction that appears in Wraith, who are scientists that wish to talk to the paranormal... Uh, pretty much all those BS Ghost Hunter shows, except this is real. They made a device that can call rates, and you can bet you you, you bet that the Gloss Orcus would be all over that the minute they find out that device exists. Yes, they would, and they'd use it against the Silent Striders. <laughs> and they would call the Emerald Legion, and it would say, "Hey, we heard you guys make some money even in death. Would you like to make some money with us?" And then the corporate empire grows. The Emerald Lord would be more than happy to give you some money. Sure, they would. Invest in Glassworker today. Become rich. <laughs> That's their slogan, is it? And Demon the Fallen. We're going to next with this one. So, DTF, it is strongly implied in it that Mars, also known as Ares, was a demon from Demon the Fallen. And. I think it would be pretty shocking if, well, a Glasswalker in the um, echoes of history in the Roman Empire might have done one or two things that could have caused Mars to grow in power. So if you want a demon to show up and then bite the world in the ass and it turns out the Glasswalkers were responsible for his rise to power, that would be a pretty nasty twist. Yes, it would. For your, for your um, chronicle. That would be a good endgame scenario there, I imagine. And um, especially the, oh, no, I'm forgetting what these guys are called. It's the kind of demon that is made out of um, minerals and forms its body out of minerals. I'm, I'm pulling up what they're called. But yeah. that would also be another great um, enemy because a, a glass worker would probably look at that and say, uh, hey, it's, a, it's an elemental spirit. Uh, let's see if we can get something out of this relationship. Oh, no, it's a demon. I'm pulling up what these guys are called. Yeah, I don't um, know either. I think they're... I found out they're malefactors. Malefactors, okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah the malefactors who are uh, guys who are made out of the earth. And most of these guys would look like machines if you spoke to them. So yeah, and the Glasswalkers would glass definitely want to... Yes, so they're going to fuck the world up. Yep. Uh, Ryan, how do you feel knowing that the world is going to end very soon and it's going to be by your own kin? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yep. He had one job. Which was make money and watch humans and make sure the humans don't grow too much. 
And instead, you have sped up human development so much where now the Geru Nation is so distracted by Pentex, they can't do anything about you. Yeah, so uh, have fun enslaving the rest of the Garo Nation. I'll, you know, try to die honorably so I don't have to live in that absolute fucking nightmare of a future that your clan, Johnny, is going to fucking create. Yes, this is why I say with them, we're going to fight for the winning team. Not a hell with that. I'll die with my boots on. And I don't give a shit. And life will be boring forever. Ah, eh, fuck that. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like in the uh, it's just like in the end of Red versus Blue. Today's a good day to die. Uh, respectfully, sir. Fuck that. <laughs> glass walkers. And that's it. GG, Brian. That's D. it. Yeah. Good night, fellas. Yeah, glass walk. All right. See you guys later.